The Yappy Chatterbox Podcast presents The Extraordinary Ordinary Interview with Matt Cizo. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Matt Cizo. Matt is an artist and husband whose paintings have been shown in various museums all over the world. Even though his art has been displayed in prestigious museums all over, it's Matt's do-it-yourself ethics and approach to his artwork by making it accessible to everyone is what makes him and his philosophy on art so extraordinary. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the Extraordinary Ordinary Podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I ju- so I happen either in a previous episode or after you, um, I just had the honor of uh, interviewing your wife, Dana, uh, who is an artist and uh, and as well, and you as well, of course, um, are an artist. But I don't know if you know this, but we've actually been friends for 20 plus years. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> yes, exactly. So sort of how I... Um, so first off, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show. This is probably one of the biggest... I, I had to pinch myself about 15 times before I came here today because um, I can't tell you how much of an honor and just how surreal this is to be able to talk to someone who, in my opinion, um, lives an extraordinary life where it's something that I'll never understand. But I hope through this interview that I'll actually be able to kind of get an idea of what you do as an artist. Um, so how I actually met you was, is about in the early 2000s, uh, two friends of mine as myself, uh, and myself, we came down to Washington DC for the weekend. Um, we were just, you know, having fun as, you know, young 20 somethings would, uh, visiting the city and stuff like that. And we happened to come across sort of like a, a fair slash art show or something like that. Um, so my friend ended up actually buying a painting from you. Um, it was about a postcard sized painting and it had track star on it. Oh. Um, so, um, i every time I would go to his house, every time I would sort of, rem- you know, even when I wasn't, when I had moved and we sort of fell out of touch, I, that painting always stuck with me. Um, so in my sort of 20 years of, of sort of living my life and going through my life, I always came back to you at certain points. I would just say, oh, I wonder what, what that artist Matt's doing. And I was sort of curious about it. So, um, But then at a certain point in my life, my life sort of went a different direction. And I said, you know what? Um, I want my track star painting uh-huh. from Matt. So um, I ended up uh, looking at your website more and more frequently. Um, found a painting that I just loved um, and then uh, contacted you and purchased a painting from you. And then, of course, you can't just buy you always can't just buy one. Uh, When I came to visit you, um, I ended up purchasing purchasing a couple of more paintings from you. Um, So I have become a fan of your work. Um, So when you uh, when you opened up your home and opened up sort of you to be able to kind of come on this little podcast with me, I couldn't, I couldn't have accepted fast enough or just sort of wanted to plan this. So I want to say first off, thank you so much for being on the show. It is, it is going to be so much fun. I can't wait. This is going to, this right. is going to be great. Um, I'm already giddy from when uh, I spoke to Dana. So this is just going to be another two plus more hours of just me on cloud nine. So, um, it'll be fun for me too. So awesome. That's fun. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to kind of like the old television show. This is your life, Matt. So, um, where did you grow up? I grew up, um, just outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, kind of in a, uh, I guess you'd call it rural setting. Um, the housing development was just kind of created in a cornfield. And um, but that's where my dad and mom built built their house. Um, and so anyways, yeah, it, it was just kind of a, I went to kind of a farmer kid school and um, it was called Waverly. Nebraska. Nice. <laughs> um, you said uh, so. Parents, mother and father, brothers, sisters. Yeah, uh, a older brother and a younger sister. God. Oh, so you're the middle child. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. That <laughs> might explain a lot. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, so at a young age, um, so 
were your parents sort of encouraging or how was your home life? Um, did your parents encourage you to be active? Did they encourage you in your interests? Were they, you know, what did they do to kind of, you know, you were like, well, I like to do this. I want to do this. Were they sort of all in or did they let you do what you wanted to do? Were they kind of just sitting in the background and be like, okay, if he starts to, if it starts to get bad, we'll, we'll guide him the right way. But, but how encouraging were they with you with, sort of your interests as a kid and sort of growing up. Yeah, I th they were always and I always have been super supportive, um, even with my dumbest decisions, you know, trying to almost like learn by by doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but growing up where I did, there was a lot of outdoor time. We grew up by a pond, which was cool. So you could skate on it in the winter or go fishing in the summer. So I learned a lot of like, that kind of stuff, you know, um, you know, we climb trees, fall out of trees, wipe out on your bike, on the dirt road, all that good stuff. So it was a very physical, you know, always played sports and, um, you know, just, I guess, typical 70s, yeah. <laughs> 80s upbringing. Gotcha. Um, um, and then, of course, you know, you'll get further into the, the big story, but I'll let you ask that yeah. question. So yeah. were you, as a younger kid, were you into, so you're an artist now, were were you, when you were younger, were you into art at that time, or were, did you have other interests as a kid? No, I, I didn't really ever like art or think I would ever be involved in any kind of art. Maybe, maybe I'd want to be in a band or something when I was in high school, or... Um, I, you know, I guess I wanted to be good at sports when I was really young. And, um, the big, the main thing that really took my, my time and my attention growing up was computers. I, um, was lucky enough to purchase an Atari 2600 after detasseling corn, uh, one summer, you know, kind of the idea was you work all summer detasseling corn and then you get this check. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out to be like, you know, three bucks an hour or something, but, um, so working in the fields and then I, I took my money and, and bought a, a, you know, video game system. But what turned out there was, I guess that kind of got me interested in art in the sense that I saw the games as art and the, the colors and the, you know, the, the sound, all that, like it was, mm -hmm. it was very, it was magic. And, um, one of the early cartridges I bought was basic programming. Oh, okay. So, so you were really, so, so you kind yeah. of were on the cutting edge of like video games, you know, computers, yeah. that kind of held your interest even at a younger age when you were, you know, playing your Atari and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to learn how to do it. Like that was, it was more than just like, Oh, this is cool. No, I actually wanted to learn how to, how to make those things. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. So that, okay. that's probably, I guess the closest I got to art. And then I, eventually taught myself how to program pascal language and th then that got me jobs in okay. high school as a programmer so oh, okay, I, I cool. was actually programming where he has a programmer um in the summers oh okay so so that's kind of during your high school so yeah we'll get yeah. to that yeah that'll yeah. be that's really kind of neat yeah, yeah you don't you don't hear a lot of uh high school kids being into you know computers and programming no. and all that stuff so yeah yeah um so sort of um, so something kind of big happened to you at a younger age. Um, yeah. You know, if, if anyone knows you, um, sort of, they probably know your story. Um, so uh, at eight years old, um, something sort of um, happened in your life that that sort of is is kind of a permanent, uh, not permanent, or just sort of something that that again that happened. And uh, I'll let you kind of explain it. You know, and, and so it's because because it's kind of very, it doesn't define you, but it's something that, um, you know, I think melded you or just it changed your life. Would you say? Oh yeah, definitely. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it didn't happen. No, I suppose. no, I don't think so. I think uh, uh, I disagree, Matt. I think your art speaks uh, for itself. Well, I'd be speaking to you because you're well, an artist. Well, I don't. Th I don't think I'd be an artist. Oh, okay. If it didn't happen. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, um, or if I consider, I don't even. Well, we'll get to call that. myself an artist. Yeah, too we'll, much, but, we'll talk about that um, later. Yeah. So, like I said, we had a pond, and uh, we had out. You know, also dirt roads, very rural, and but also we had a small airport nearby so there was a grassy runway and um 
you know, kids out playing, playing by the runway <laughs> one summer day in the 70s. And um, the plane was, because there's like those small propeller airplanes, I guess Cessna, Piper Cub, whatever they're called. And um, one was landing. And when they land, they don't make much noise because I guess they kind of cut the engine or something. I don't know how the planes work. But um, the propeller certainly was spinning. So <laughs> what happened is the plane was landing, and I had run out onto the, the runway because um, we were playing this game of called Spud. And Spud is a game where you, everybody gets a number, and there's a ball, and somebody throws the ball in the air, calls out a number, not maybe not sure even who, which number's whom, and if your number's called, you catch the ball, you yell Spud, everybody has to stop, and then you try to hit him with the ball. Got it. Basically. Um, so it was my turn to throw the ball in the air, and I nobody had ever done this before playing, and I decided I was number four, and I decided, oh, I wonder what happens if I throw the ball in the air and call my own number. So I, I threw the ball in the air, called my own number, thought it would be really funny, so I'm laughing and running, and then I woke up in the hospital. <laughs> so, so you don't remember the incident at all? I kind of did for a lot of years, like getting hit by something. I'd have all these weird dreams, but and it was pretty painful, but um, now, I mean, the, I think the worst part is all the other kids, including my brother and sister, saw it happen. Got so it. So that's like r more tragic okay. <laughs> for so, me almost than, the, than what happened to me. So what happened was the propeller hit my uh, just below my shoulder and the arm was removed, basically, or barely hanging on. And so they they sewed it back on at the hospital. Um, it, I guess it was a doctor who had just got back from Vietnam. So had some experience with that. You know, we're Lincoln, Nebraska, which you know, is a fairly big city. It's a college town, but um, I guess that was lucky that he was there. And so there was a lot of debate, you know, keep the elbow, don't keep the elbow. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they, they, they reattached the arm, and um, what happened is the hand wasn't getting any circulation, I guess, or enough. Mm -hmm. So turns purple. I remember, you know, seeing a purple hand, uh, gangrene or whatever. And um, so they had to cut the hand off in the hospital. And... Um, that was, the, you know, like the debate, elbow, no elbow, stuff like that, you know, and, and little things like that have made such a difference for me having one hand is that um, just just an elbow is like having a finger <laughs> in a weird sense. Um, I guess I'm going down a weird, weird path here. But um, so anyways, that that kind of defined me, mm -hmm. I guess, or at the time. I mean, it was a, it was a really crazy, tragic mm -hmm. thing, I guess. But um the way my family treated it and mom and dad, and everybody like, it was like, almost like, okay, we'll just get back out there. And I was, I mm -hmm. think I was pitching baseball. I was a pitcher on our little baseball team, like the following summer. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, you know, get back out there. It was always encouraged not to, not to, you know, let it be a victim of it or anything like that. Like it was just like, okay, well, you know, mm -hmm. you did, you adapt. Got it. Uh, were you, left-handed or right-handed <laughs> i was left-handed and okay. that was the one i lost so i had to um relearn i guess how to write and stuff like that but at eight years old i don't think any of us are great of pen, penmanship or anything yep. like that yeah um so when i don't want to dwell on it but i do have just some questions um so you kind of you black out as soon as it happens yeah okay i think i i, I Th they that's what I, you can remember yeah they said i stopped moving and all that kind of weird stuff so i don't okay. know if i had a near-death experience or anything gotcha. like that but. when when you wake up um sort of and you see what goes through i mean do you because again you're eight years old so it's it's kind of probably going to be hard to uh, elaborate on just how you felt what was it like stuff like that but if you can you know when you wake up when you eventually wake up into the hospital when you look over are you do, do, do what what sort of what is your, do you remember what your first reaction was way back then or is it sort mm. of just a blur yeah i think i remember the first time i woke up in intensive care yeah, i think my i think my parents were there and um i remember looking at my hand and it was all purple and i could barely move the fingers like that's mm -hmm. kind of the f first thing i remember and then there was kind of like this whole story i have of almost like a guardian angel or something you know saying do you want to live or do you want to um or do you want to die and, you know, basically go to heaven or whatever that, that is. And then, um, or do you want to live, have an, and, you know, fight to live and have an interesting life, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I think that might be a way I explained it to myself is that from that moment on, I had to 
you know, almost have to like work harder or try, you know, like try, maybe try a different thing, you know, mm -hmm. than maybe selling car insurance or something like that, which is a good, a good job. But I'm just saying, yep. like, I didn't, I didn't feel like from that moment on, maybe I, I had like a different path to take. Gotcha. Yes. Now, did you, um, you mentioned the fact that they reattached the whole entire arm. Um, how did you go through the process of trying to recover the entire arm or was it, did you go through like physical therapy? Did you do any of that stuff or was it pretty much, um, you know, they, they knew after a short amount of time that it, the whole arm was not recoverable. Do you remember oh, any yeah. of this? I, I think they okay. do right away because I remember saying, take it off. Like, oh, okay. They so actually, they go, oh, well, we're going to have to remove your hand. I go, that's okay. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, what didn't even seem like a, a big deal almost. It was, it was, you know, just I was in the hospital. I wanted to get better, I guess. Or, yeah. You yeah. want to get out of it. As an eight year old, you don't want to be in the hospital. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so, um, so they, so you have the, the hand removed and, and so what is it like, again, being eight years old and sort of, do you live a, do you just begin or just continue to play, you know, to play mm -hmm games and and do you just sort of grow up and and sort of yeah. that type of thing was there any struggle like what was it you know was it difficult did you ever sort of get mad that you didn't have like that you couldn't sort of use your hand or anything like that like did it ever get frustrating did you ever get angry did you ever get upset that sort of you know that that you couldn't use both hands and sort of that type of thing yeah i mean i i suppose i mean like maybe if i was trying to impress a girl or something you know maybe i was like oh no maybe it's because i have one hand or something i don't mm -hmm. know i mean that's kind of a, a weird you know thing to say which i don't think is valid but um because look at dana's with me she's awesome <laughs> yeah i know yeah <laughs> but, um, so um yeah i mean I, but no i didn't, definitely didn't let's i mean i i broke my arm again the same arm after like because we were playing you know like playing like football or something in the backyard Okay. Broke, it, broke it again <laughs> and that was a weird thing because i would have to wear a cast the, you know they put a cast on it but the trick with a cast on their arm is you usually have a wrist to keep the cast on mm -hmm. so so many days i'd come home from school with my cast in a bag because <laughs> it had fallen off at school so my arm didn't quite heal back great mm -hmm. but you know but but you so you were so you just sort of dealt with what happened and sort of went along with it there was never yeah. any sort of frustration or you know angry mm. mad anything like that just you know as an eight-year-old kid you just sort of dealt with it and went forward yeah i don't think i was angry um i think i keep all that stuff inside and i had for so long mm -hmm. and i probably yeah, i'm sure there's lots of anger that mm -hmm. i have never really expressed or whatever i mean that's just part of it but i that's why and we'll get to that in the painting like i think sometimes my paintings are so aggressive or I try to make them aggressive because it's like the music I listen to and stuff it's all about that like almost anti-authority anti um I guess normalcy like I, mm -hmm. I I I dwell in the in the um not so much bizarre or or weird but in the um kind of like if you know some like if you know it's almost like conspiratorial like you know that what you're seeing on TV, maybe you, that doesn't make any sense. You know, mm -hmm. they're lying to you or something, or, or there is kind of like a, a, a sense that maybe you don't hold, know the whole story or something. So I would take like a contrarian viewpoint on something and just, and just dive into as far as I could to, you know, whether it's politics or, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yep. pers um, vaccines. I mean, who knows? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so normal sort of everyday high school like life um what in you know what did you do it was high school just sort of just high school like a regular high school kid in nebraska you know like i noticed you played yeah. football like mm -hmm. sort of um were you did you get more into computers and sort of yeah. technology and stuff when you were in high school yeah i think i played sports just to kind of be contrarian to coaches who maybe didn't want me to be on the team or they because i was I didn't really enjoy it. I don't think mm -hmm. sports after a while, like I was kind of like just doing it to prove a point, I think in the end, especially football. Like I remember our last game when we lost, I was like so happy. I was like, Oh God, I have to do this again. Yep, <laughs> Cause I done. didn't like the practices and stuff. And mm -hmm. it was just seemed like a waste of time to me. But, um, cause at the time I was basically 
learning computers, teaching myself all this stuff with my free time. Like I would spend pretty much all my free time on the computer at an Apple II at the time. So like in school, I was, you know, that we had a computer class and the teacher, you know, she didn't, I mean, she was great, but she didn't really understand them <laughs> like I and a couple other kids did. So we would actually, like, for example, she'd say, oh, hey, um, you know, this computer over here isn't working. Can you guys see if you can fix it? And what what I had done is open up the, the computer, the Apple, and I pulled one of the chips up just so, you know, I knew it wouldn't boot. Mm -hmm. And then I could, you know, basically have the whole whole class to screw around. And oh, I'd go, nice. oh, at the end, I'd go, oh, look, I fixed it. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's those little stupid things like that. But um yeah, I mean, I was, I was, my mind wasn't really in the, uh, yeah, I was looking, I think I was living in the future a little bit. Once I started to really get into computers, I was like, okay, this is, this is, this is it. This is, this so is good. That's what, so that, that in all intents and purposes, that was going to be your sort of, um, your, what you were going to do, yeah. you know, going forward. Yeah. So I got, you know, went to college in Tulsa university, university of Tulsa. Oh, and, okay. Yep. Um, computer science or computer information systems. It was kind of like computers with business. Gotcha. And because um, I was really bad at calc. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love the computer stuff. I wanted to be a programmer, but um, yeah, some of that, some of the more, I didn't get so much into the engineering side as far as like the, the electronics of it and stuff, but I was more into software. And um, so I got a job with IBM right out of college, which was mm -hmm. sweet. So that's how I got here to DC is, they hired me. Um, it was a perfect job for me because it was a tester. So okay. I got to write code to, you know, build like automation software and stuff like that. But then I also got to point out problems. Gotcha. Like de defects in a sense. Okay. Which I think is part of my personality that I thrive on seeing, like looking past the, the, whatever, the, the main, um, talking point is of something or not what's what's the right word i'm thinking of you know like a the main narrative like if the narrative is oh yeah this works i you know like an like a programmer would give me the code and say okay this all works now but you, you need to test it and i would always and i kind of i would say i don't believe you there's going to be a problem with mm -hmm. this and so i i do that that's kind of been my whole life i guess so so college at tulsa was just normal college taking classes did you mm. sort of foray into any other type of stuff at college like oh hell yeah okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> like outside of computers like did yeah. you know what else what else sort of like interest you in college you yeah know? that's good so what happened in college is when I really started to have to take classes on computers, I was like, this is kind of boring. Like yeah. after a while I was like, this like, you know, isn't really as interesting as I was hoping it would be. So I started, um, I worked on getting a radio station set up so that, cause growing up in Lincoln was really fortunate for me in Nebraska that a lot of the good bands that were going across country would stop in Lincoln and play so I'd get to occasionally see like some really cool bands and stuff. And I, and we had a really good college radio station. So then when I got to Oklahoma, it was like, it was classical station, which I mean, I love classical music now, but I don't know anything about it. But, um, but I was like, God, where's the punk rock? Where's the, you know, where's the edge? Where's the, and it was just nothing. And so I got something started with that a little bit, like a, like a, um, I guess it ended up, I, I tried to get the college radio station to change its format, but they wouldn't. <laughs> And now I understand why, because who's going to donate to the college radio station if it's, you know, music people don't listen to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just me. Yep. Yeah. And well, now they listen to it. They, now <laughs> they listen to it. But back then they weren't no. listening to it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I ended up just volunteering basically at a local radio station. And they, <laughs> it was Oklahoma. They, they didn't know what I was playing. I was bringing my albums in from home. Oh, nice. I had a, a lot of like hardcore stuff and I was playing that and of course they once they finally listened to my show, like I was removed. <laughs> but whatever. It was, they were they the were more into, like disco and yeah. whatever that stuff is. But um which is fine. It's yeah. good stuff. But um so that was kind of yeah, always contrarian and then I I was homecoming king one year, got elected into that wow the, the prestigious event. That was fun. Um and even ran for, I was like a student senator. So I did, you know, I had politics and I was in a frat, I was Kappa Sigma. Nice. And, um, you know, it, it was good. And I really thrived, I think, in college. It was like a kind of like a playground, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, okay, this, you get to do what you want. And I really, I loved it. I loved mm -hmm. college. Yeah. So, um, 
we, you know, you, you are, you are an artist now, but, um, so let's just say from college before, so up to college, um, any art inclination did you were did you draw did you did you foray into any type of art um were you interested in art like did you like art um did you have like favorite artists or sort of was that just you know again you're 19 20 like yeah. i was like i really wasn't into that stuff when i was 18 19 it wasn't until i got older but but um did you have like did you like to draw did you like to do art at that time or was it pretty much you know, like you like just computers and sort of, you know, homecoming king and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, I I, I did um, at in university. I, I worked with the um, I guess it was activities or something like like if there was something coming through town, I would do the flyers for that. And I would do it by cutting out pictures of these magazines, like kind of make them like a punk. Yep. All flyers. the old school punk. Yep. 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 I know so that I all too basically well. Basically yep. Using that technique and cutting out the letters and, you know, it was all black and white photocopied stuff and it looked cool. So I, d I did a lot of that kind of design and advertising. And I, I remember I didn't, it was a marketing class. Somebody in my, I guess my fraternity or one of my friends told me, they said that the professor actually was had all my flyers and was showing the class that this is effective advertising. Nice. That I was that I you know was used as an example as a, a good example, I guess. So that was nice. But um, and I guess that kind of hit my dopamine levels a little bit. Like I, it gave me a good feeling. I was like, oh, I'm good at this. Okay. So, so it was kind of like that. Kind of got me into visual, like trying to, you know, maybe maybe that led to some of the art stuff. And I, and when I had a Macintosh, one of the early Macs, I would use that to draw with like McPaint or whatever the, <laughs> the old thing was. Um, so I, w I was doing that and drawing around and I, st I still have some of that old stuff, but um, yeah, that was probably, probably, I, I liked um, when we went to see my grandparents in Florida, we'd go to the Salvador Dali museum. Oh yeah. I've been there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep, that place is wild. Yeah, that that's was really cool neat. Cool because um, they have this masterworks there, like the ones that are like <laughs> thirty feet high and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and we went on one of the tours once there, and I listened to the story about why and how, and I was like, oh, okay. So, that sounds pretty cool, I guess. And then also, when my parents were f from the East Coast, my mom New York and my dad Vermont, and so we went to New York City a couple times, and we'd go like the MoMA. Mm -hmm. um, How did they end uh, up in Nebraska? Uh, my dad was a teacher, oh, okay, university, gotcha. okay. yeah, professor, and then my mom was a teacher as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, it, it's good. It's good that to grow up there too, because I, I mean, it, it was probably a good work ethic that I picked up there. Gotcha. So, yeah. so in college, are you pretty much dead set on you know I'm gonna work in computers like technology stuff like that? Um, were you, you know, and you're in Tulsa at the time. So, so are you looking, are you looking to stay in Tulsa and work in computers or was your desire to, you know, again, number one, first question, you know, were you planning coming out of college and working with computers and technology and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I wanted to set my, you know, my goal really high as far as what would be the best computer company back then it was IBM. Okay. So that was kind of my, you know, I always like to hit, set really high goals like that. And, um, so yeah, that 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 was it, and I got that got me out to DC. Okay, so it was so you you yeah. so it was in DC. I'm assuming IBM is everywhere, but mm -hmm. why was DC sort of its main hub? Or um, yeah, the, the reason was because IBM came through college and did interviews, and that was how I got it. I, I mean, it could have been any IBM. Like it wasn't Silicon Valley, but I did work for IBM in Silicon Valley for a while. But um, yeah, it was just. Because I came out here, interviewed, I loved it. I was like, "This is cool." Gotcha. What What did you like so much about DC that that made you want to work, coming right out of college? Because that's a pretty big experience to go from Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Washington DC, mm -hmm. working for IBM. How was that? Yeah, like, I, I think it was when I had the interview. The it was like the Keybridge Marriott. It's really funny because every time we walk walk or see it, I always point it out to Dan. I go, "Hey, that's where I had my first interview." Um, it was in a hotel and. I remember walking across the Key Bridge to Georgetown and finding the record stores and getting the local cassettes and the local music. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, nice. Minor Threat and all Black Flag. All this. You know, like it's, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of great, great music here. And that, yes, that's kind of why I think. Yeah. I, I want to talk about because <laughs> finding it. 
this is something I've known about you, but this, this, that, that whole conversation can dwell. We'll do that off, off record. <laughs> this is about you, okay. not about where we are and what music you're into. Okay. And that's actually, um, to kind of, as an aside, I'm also, uh, the friends actually, as a side note, we can kind of go back. The friends that I came to DC with are the ones that introduced me to that type of music. Oh, nice. So we are talking about the stuff that, you know, that we are both big fans of. So, um, when you, st- I don't want to get into okay. it because it can, right. we could have a whole conversation that has nothing to do with why we're here, but, but no. Okay. So, so, uh, just to go back. Um, so you pretty much said, I'm, I'm, you know, you did your interview, you found the record stores that you liked and you said, this is it. I'm here. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, so, so what's it like? What do you do for IBM? I mean, at that time, when was this? Do you, do you know what time? Yeah, it you- was 1988, okay. 89. And, um, yeah, I was testing software. We were doing um, a lot of stuff with image processing. It was like, I think one of the big projects would be like digitizing the Vatican's books or something like that. I mean, I, I never was on that specific project, but where I was working in Bethesda, we did a lot of image image related stuff, which now just seems so, you know, everywhere. Obviously, you, know, you go to the internet, there's all pictures, but mm-hmm. that that was very expensive and very hard (laughs) back in the early days (laughs) of course and then some work with like ocr you know which i guess ibm was going to charge a lot of money for that and now you can get it for free pretty much (laughs) so um but i loved it it was it was a really good chance for me to show my abilities as far as like my brain because there were things that i figured out that nobody else had done yet oh testing which was really cool like you know installing some hardware that could do automation and writing code for that. It, I mean, it was very rewarding. Um, um, and then I started painting. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you said, so were you, did you just stay in, in DC? Like, um, you know, you mentioned it's, well, I'm saying like when you worked, so you got the job with IBM, did you, was that, was it pretty much DC? You mentioned you were in Silicon Valley at some mm-hmm. point. So did you move or, or did yeah. you, okay. So, so you weren't just, in dc the entire time so like no. ibm so you lived in silicon valley for a while and yep. okay yeah so I, I worked with um yeah we the, we had the opportunity to move to silicon valley once they closed our division it was either go to silicon valley or raleigh north carolina i went to both silicon valley of course music scene yep <laughs> of course and um or san jose and um so but i was i had a, i was already painting at the time but anyways i, I worked in computers and painted at the same time and i can tell you why later but um yeah i worked at netscape i worked at aol oh okay i worked at some startups when i got back to dc um so what brought you back to dc uh done with the peace corps i was in the peace oh, corps okay. okay so wow okay so this is all okay <laughs> there's a lot of stuff yeah so um okay so your so ibm dc you go to silicon valley you're you're living there okay um do you do you when you're there do you decide to go into the peace corps or do you work in that sort of silicon yeah. valley area for a while i was i was, I was actually like for netscape and stuff like yeah. that is that in silicon valley yeah. or okay. yeah so i did i worked for ibm i got married i mean it's like and then <laughs> came back to dc Went back to Silicon Valley. I, mean, I can't. I think I'm only gone back three times. I, I okay. Dan always laughs at me because I can't remember how many no, times that's I okay. But but the the thing that always got me back here is I bought a place in Adams Morgan when I first started working, and I tried to sell it. I couldn't sell it. I mean, now of course it'd be worth a ton of money, but of course, yeah. you couldn't. You couldn't. You know, it was a different yeah. city back then. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was yeah Silicon. Valley. So once once I got my job with Netscape. It was kind of a important job, but then there wasn't anything to do. Like we were working on the new web browser or the mail part of it. I can't remember, but and, and, but my job wasn't really there wasn't anything to do yet. Mm-hmm. It, it was boring. I was just sitting around doing nothing, and I was like, I'm just wasting my time. Mm-hmm. So joined the Peace Corps. <laughs> nice. So you also, but you did mention that you were you started to dabble in painting at the time, correct? Yeah. Okay. I, I started here in DC in 1994 when you were working for IBM. Okay, so even so right out of college, so pretty much around that time, yep. your first job. Okay. So how does it start? 
like yeah. how does how does the when like what what makes you pick up a brush or a, a pen or or a you know what was your what was your first drawing let's say let's yeah. put it that way and and what made you pick up that implement to do that first drawing so what it was was um i was going on a date and this girl lived in a <laughs> she later became my wife um not dana and um uh went to her group house because she you know people live in group houses down here i guess or i don't know if they still do if the kids do that it's a very effective way to save money oh of course yeah in any big so, city yeah yes. so okay. much, yep. much of them sharing a house and a lot of um, them or a few of them were in bands and they knew everybody knew you know knows somebody in a band down here and so it was in mount pleasant so i i just i had my place in adams morgan so i walked over there i get there and there's like some had been in art school and they were sitting around drawing on this big table in their dining room and you know i'm trying to be cool you know and uh, i'm a computer nerd and they go to me I go oh do, do you know how to paint matt i go sure <laughs> i just lied so I just picked it up, and there was a city paper there, which is kind of the it was it was a cool thing back in the early '80s or '90s, and um, there would be like ads for bands and stuff. So I would just look. I looked. I think the first thing I drew out of there was probably like you know for some ad or something, or just a person standing, you know, like just a kind of a port portrait type thing. And then ah, uh, then I did another and another and another, and those guys all went off and smoked their pot or did whatever they did and i stayed and kept drawing and drawing and then i was just like oh man after a while people started liking what i was doing because i was trying to be contrarian of course with my art i was like oh let's you know let's make the lips crazy and the heads and the mm -hmm. you know the, all the colors are off and weird and scratchy then i started like oh like the, the my lines started to get a little angry and it felt good to kind of leave it on the canvas or the not the canvas the paper at that time and then um so then what would happen is they would start hanging my pictures up on the wall of the group house and everybody would kind of because it was kind of like it came like a little gallery there so i'd have like maybe you know 40 or 50 little drawings on their wall and then they would have like parties and and people were buying them from me no way yeah so, so i was selling my art <laughs> off the wall and um you know they were just put up with push pins and stuff mm -hmm. i was like oh this feels good were like, you only doing art at the group home or or that that group house or were you doing art at your own house in adams morgan yeah at first it was just there but but then every time i would go and do it there and then but yeah then i set just something on my kitchen table yeah and um would just paint there so you would paint part-time while you were working at ibm oh yeah yeah definitely like nights i can remember one day we had a snow day <laughs> one of very few and um, I, I i was supposed to be working i spent the whole day painting oh yeah my floor was a did some really good work that day i was like oh i think yeah. i like this nice so I, I started in 94 and then i finally went full-time painting as a job in 2000 i think 2000 yeah okay so so you're doing so you're working uh at ibm and and eventually moving out to silicon valley so the whole time you're sort of in that corporate job you're also painting as well did it ever stop mm -hmm. or did you pretty much did, did painting and sort of the corporate world go hand in hand up to the point where you decided to not do the corporate world anymore? Yeah, I mean, I will always, yeah, I would, I would spend all my free time probably painting. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, but also I did film <laughs> or oh, videos. Nice. Yeah, I did. A, okay. That's why I did that before I even started painting. I think in 93, I was at a party and this guy was like saying, I can't find what he said. He said, he said, oh, I'm doing a film. And he goes, have you ever worked on film? I go, oh, yeah, sure. Lying. And um, and so I got to be like a gaffer or something on this guy's film. He was a really, really, really great guy, mm -hmm. David. And um, uh, he had like this Pixel 2000 camera. This wasn't what he filmed this like in real film, the movie he was making. But he said he had this little Fisher Price camera because I told him, oh, I'd, I'd like to do film someday maybe. And he lent it to me and it was like it would film on cassettes. Okay. And um, so I, I had it for like the weekend before I'd see him again. You know, I'd return it to him. So I just I spent all weekend making a, a short film about myself. And I used like VHS to to dub it back and forth and stuff. I think I had two tapes I must have that took forever. And I had a Mac Quadra computer. So I bought some. Oh, wait, that's the second one. Okay. First one was just tape to tape, mm -hmm. just dubbing. It took forever. Took all weekend. I, I did a painting. I or a painting. I did a film 
I wrote it, filmed it the same day. I called it Seize the Day. And I was just like, I, I mean, I, I need to put it out there because we just went and saw some film by Cocteau, the philosopher or poet mm-hmm. of art, the National Gallery of Art. And I was watching, I'm going, oh my God, it kind of looks a little bit like what I was doing. But nice. in, in some respect, the, the theme. So it was a, basically a talk with myself. Um, I was both characters in the film, and I think there was three. And it was about loss. It was about losing. It was about me losing a bike, I think mm-hmm. it was, but it, it represented my hand. Yeah. I didn't even know it till after I, like years later, I'm like, oh, that's what that's about. And I end up killing the bad me who's sad, and then I be confident that the confident me lives. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very, very, I mean, God, I, I've had shows and I can't get anyone to any of these like museums or galleries to show my films because I think they're pretty bad. Do you bad. still have them? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, and, nice. And, yeah, I've, <laughs> yeah, I need to get them out there. Are they on the website? Mm, no. No. And they used to be, but then I think all the plugins became outdated oh, and I never gotcha. updated. I, I have them though on hard drives and stuff. But, nice. Yeah, I did a bunch. And actually, I just heard from one of the people, the the um, the niece of, I guess she used to be my niece, <laughs> um, my sister's, or my wife's sister. And she was like, oh, do you still have that film? And like now she's like a, you know, a doctor or something. And she's like, God, I'd really love to see that again. Nice. And she couldn't find it on that. So I, I got to do all that. Anyways, long story. So, um, yeah, so I did films first. Nice. Little videos. It went, like I entered contests in D.C. They used to have like a film night at the place called Chief Ike's Mamba Room in Adams Morgan. And they would, uh, they'd have a film contest every year. And I entered that. And I got the, you know, the, the dopamine, I guess it's called right dopamine hits. So mm-hmm. like, it felt really good when I got like, you know, second or third place. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I want to do this. Nice. So I really like that attention that basically mm-hmm. painting gives me now every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're, you're, your pain are you taking yourself serious as sort of an artist in the way of you know you're doing you know you're painting at this group house you know just it seems mm-hmm. like for fun um you know or just to you know to do yeah. it you, you know you're scratching that that sort of artist itch um do, does it get serious does that point get serious with you like you know they're putting it up in thumbtacks you know you're they're yeah. selling it like that do you do you think, oh, wait, I've got something here. Like maybe I should start sort of, uh, you know, going a little bit more in depth with it. Nope. Or is it just for it, fun? It, w- it was a joke to me. Mm-hmm. Kind of still has. But, <laughs> um, it, it was, yeah, it, it was because I was driving through Georgetown in my old beater car with my then girlfriend, I guess. And there was an art festival in Georgetown going on. And it was a two-day festival, so people were outside selling art and stuff. And she goes, "Oh, we should, we should, you should show your paintings here." And I go, "Well, not today, because we were gonna go. I was gonna go scout out locations for like one of my dumb little videos." Mm-hmm. And um, so she made me stop and goes, "Oh, well, just ask them." And I go, "Okay, yeah, you can do it." They said they, that I could do it Sunday, which was the next day. So the next day, I pull out whatever crappy art I had and and drove to Georgetown and just set myself in front of a storefront you know, just on the sidewalk and maybe a, I don't even know if I had a blanket, but I just had all these little paintings out and I was getting ready to, it hadn't sold anything all day. I was there all day. I was like, God, this is stupid. And then, uh, and they were like 40 bucks, you know, 60 bucks, whatever. And, um, had some canvas. I mean, it's pretty wild. And then getting ready to leave. Um, I was like, let's just go. This is dumb. And so I remember calling on a payphone. She called her parents saying, oh, we're not going to we're not going to stick around because they were going to come visit and watch and see what I was doing. And they go, oh, wait, we're, we're coming. We're coming. Just wait a bit longer. So I said, OK, sure. So I stayed a little bit longer. And then all of a sudden, this lady who was visiting her son in town, um, she stopped. She goes, oh, my God. And she went just flipped out and she saw my art. And she's like, oh, and so it turns out she was like a an art dealer. Oh, wow. <laughs> from Connecticut. So the, Dan hates her because it's like my first time ever. I basically got an agent. So she signed me up. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I had an agent the first day. And um, that's so that inter- was interesting the first life. time. And that was just your first time selling. Like you just decided out to in sell. public. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Because it was mostly in the house. Like you said, the, you were like yeah. were buying some art like tacked up on the walls and stuff like yeah. that. But this was the first sort of. Now, did she buy a piece? She bought everything. She bought everything. Yeah. What was that like? I didn't believe her. I didn't. <laughs> and then I, then I was, you know, I was working at IBM making whatever IBM money. 
and um, she sent me a contract, and I had supposedly <laughs> good people I could trust look at this contract. It was very, it was pretty binding now that I think about it. But yeah, she had like write a first refusal to everything I did, and I was, and I'm, I'm, I'm like painting like crazy. I'm doing, you know, like three or four paintings a day, probably when while working at IBM. Yeah, probably okay. at my at my peak, and then, but I had to run everything by her. So this is ninety four, ninety five. There's no real internet. There's no digital cameras, mm -hmm. so I had to buy a Polaroid, and I would take pictures of every painting in Polaroids. So an actual physical picture I'd be sending in the mail to her, and she said mm -hmm. whether she wanted them or not. What was the feeling of her? Like, were you like, like you said you didn't believe her? Like, mm -hmm. what do you? How do you react to a woman coming up to you and saying, "I want to be your art agent, mm -hmm. and I want to buy everything"? Are you? flabbergasted or or is it just like you just rolled with it yeah i didn't i didn't you know because i wasn't making big money she was charging a lot once after when i first started she would charge more than i charge now um and she was great though i i wouldn't be where i am without her either mm -hmm. so it, it was it was it had to happen because i was introduced to like the folk art outsider art but what what happened with that is a lot of those people in that art type are not educated not just well, definitely self-taught like i'm definitely self-taught they're self-taught but a lot of them might actually be fringe like out out like they didn't maybe go to college or they didn't teach themselves how to program or, mm -hmm. you know and 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 i started to feel like i it wasn't it wasn't me like i was kind of being labeled at something that i didn't think was really it didn't i didn't feel comfortable in it mm -hmm. um and people still call me the outsider visionary whatever folk art i, I don't know what i am i just mm -hmm. i just like to throw stuff at the canvas gotcha was that art that you did back then similar to what you do now or was it completely different um yeah pretty much it i've always had like the lips the teeth the you know the scratchy stuff the color scheme um yeah pretty much the same i use a lot of the same uh, paint brands and stuff that I did back then. Um, luckily, we have a really great art store here in D.C., U-Tractor. It's now called Dick Blick, but that was really fortunate because they have really good quality paint. And then um, this isn't an ad. No, 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 no of course <laughs> no. not. But um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's all the same pretty much. But one of the most transformative moments in my art career was when – career, well, whatever I call it. But um, – was when the movie Basquiat came out. And I'd been painting, I think it came out in like 98 or 99. Yeah. David Bowie is, yeah. uh, as uh, Andy Warhol. Warhol. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because Andy Warhol's a Pittsburgh guy. So ah, that yeah, was, right. yeah. So, yeah. but it's it was, I, I watched that movie. <laughs> I've watched that movie recently. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's funny. Yeah. Uh, so, Andy Warhol, uh, as David Bowie as Andy Warhol is pretty yeah. good. Yeah. So it was like a, it was the day it opened. It was in DuPont Circle. I remember the day. I was like, oh, Basquiat, it's an art movie. I'll go see that. And I went all by myself. First one. I remember even they passed out like a survey after the film to what you liked about it and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so funny. Very weird. But I went and I remember watching the scene where, because I didn't even know his art. And and the, it's like an art dealer pulling, looking at all the, his paintings when he's kind of discovered. And I was like, oh, that kind of happened to me. And I and she's looking, and she's showing his stuff. And I started, I started crying. I was like, oh, my God. I can totally do this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really what got me. I was like, ah. Oh. And then I realized iconography, use that more, like use my, you know, language. And I definitely am, was influenced probably more by the film than actual Basquiat paintings. But I have done a recent show at um, at Old Dominion University, uh, and they had – it was a solo show of mine of all of my work from, like, 94 to now or – two years ago and um there was original Basquiat's in the show and oh, the, nice. the, so the curator actually curated in Basquiat with my work so I have shown with Basquiat I guess I'm um, just showing the influence and the similarities and stuff and um you know I I, I agree I, a lot of my stuff does look a little bit like it or a lot of like it but I'm not sitting looking at a book or ever I've never looked at one of his paintings and gone yeah. oh I'm gonna but I can see like maybe some of my rising some of my iconography is very similar like that that line drawing and um, but I think now I've painted more than he did. I'm isn't sure. It in the isn't in the movie he calls it like ignorant art or yeah, something yeah, like stupid, that? Yeah, ridiculous art. Yeah, yeah. I, that's exactly what I think mm -hmm. of mine. Like when he would do those littles, like mm -hmm. the one that you said you got the track star. Yep. That's where I came up with that idea. Do those smalls, just do stupid, ridiculous art and just sell them like 
20 bucks, 30 bucks, whatever. Yep. And I still do that. And nice. um, there's thousands and thousands of those yeah. out there. <laughs> so, so you become a, you, you, you find yourself an agent while you're working at IBM. Mm -hmm. um, do you start, um, so you mentioned like net, you work for Netscape. Did you eventually come back to IBM? Like, or did you, so like you worked for IBM, then you started working for like AOL, Netscape, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you get to, when the person signs you on as their agent, are you, are you, are you still with IBM and then you move forward to those other companies or are you back with IBM? Kind of, I'm yeah. just trying to get an understanding of sort of that point in time when it sort of, when it changes. So, yeah. so I, yeah, I was, I had the agent all through till 2000, I guess. Okay. Um, and that's my last job was when here in uh, DC in Georgetown where it all began, I was working at a company and they, they were, um, I was a tester there and they um, had layoffs and it was another one of those where I didn't have enough stuff to do. I would sit around all day go, oh, this is really, I'm not doing anything I could be painting. And um, they, I got laid off and I just remember they, walked, they told me that and I go, thank you. I just, I was like, thank you. You're freeing me. So on my way, walking back to Adams Morgan, cause I'd walk to work. I stopped by this uh, CD warehouse, which is a little record store art gallery on M Street, and I said, hey, can I have a show here? And they go, yeah. They go, sure. Or, you know, after they looked at my stuff, and so I did, I wasn't even home from the day I got laid off. When I was walking out, I said, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go full time. Nice. So you didn't, <laughs> so, so it wasn't a thing where you decided I want to go from working in the corporate world to painting. You got laid off and you're like, all right, new, new uh, yeah. situation just came up and I can use that. So, mm -hmm. So, um, were, so did people at work know that you were a painter? Did uh, people like, were people fan, <laughs> like were coworkers oh, fans of your painting? Heck yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause I would go, I remember going to meetings and I would have like, cause I use a lot of metal paint. Sometimes I use my, the little paint on my hand now, but, um, I mean, I, my whole arm would be covered like, you know, paint or gesso or something. I have a, I'd smell of probably turpentine and booze, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, from painting the night before and, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I had a, I had an opening at the Corcoran Museum, ga uh, gallery. I guess White Walls Gallery. It's kind of downstairs. But um, they get. I got a show there, and all the people I worked with came. Like a lot of them, a lot of my friends from work came, and that, and they bought them. Um, you know, bought paintings. I still have um, sales to some of those people I worked with from back then. Um, very supportive because they were all super creative people. Like all of them are like, you know, bands again and mm -hmm. like bands I like. I was like, oh, I'm working with someone. So yeah, that was really cool. Nice. Um, yeah. So, so you mentioned that you decided to go into the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. um, so was the Peace Corps, did you go into the Peace Corps um, while you were working at IB or working in the corporate world? Yeah. Okay. So I, I was in San Jose. I, I was going to the Peace Corps, I was going to go as a single person because I wasn't married yet, but my girlfriend at the time, she's like, I want to go to the Peace Corps too. So we got married. <laughs> so she had come with us. I had to apply twice for the Peace Corps. I got him both times, second time with her, and went to the Solomon Islands. That was your first. So what makes you decide to go join the Peace Corps? Because again, if, if I were to ask my boss, hey, I'm, mm -hmm. or, you know, I'm going to join the Peace Corps, you know, more than likely, you're not going to be working for the company while you're no, with the no, Peace Corps. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. So what? No, I quit. <laughs> yeah. So what made you decide to join the Peace Corps? What was what was that sort of what what was that choice? Or? I think I wanted to be challenged. I think I was kind of like, this is computer stuff. I mean, I like it, but it only goes so far. Like, I want to. I'd rather create the whole program myself rather than just be a cog in the you know, you know it, which isn't realistic of course you're not going to create your own especially now with coding teams doing everything but um yeah i needed to have more more contact with the end product basically it's the adam smith type thing which i learned that in my liberal arts education but you know where you have where the worker is more satisfied when the worker has direct um contact whether with the end product or even the customer like which I can get into all this whole theories of why I love painting so much because I do get the total, I get every step of the way. I get to meet with the, I, you know, I, I love it. I buy the pro, I buy the materials. I do the shipping. I do everything. I do the website. That's a whole mm -hmm. other thing we can go down to. But um, 
Yeah, so Peace Corps. So we went Solomon Islands. Did you choose that or no? Or, they okay. choose it for you. And I, I, it's a little tough. So what happened was, got to there. I was just you know the computers were kind of getting in into the Solomon Islands a little bit. Like the Peace Corps office had a computer and they needed help with that. And I was like, hey, I could I can do this for you. I could do all your computer stuff. You know, maybe just work at the office or work in the city, the main city. But now put me out where there was no electricity, <laughs> no water. It's all rain catchment. It was it was really rough, really remote. Mm -hmm. And um, wife was there. She came with. She freaked out after a few months. Quit. I'm like, I'm staying. I have to do this. What was it like? What was it that that made you like? What was it that that made you stay? And sort of what did well, you like about it I so didn't, much? I didn't stay that much longer. What happened was, because we had like a two way, you had a, you had like a short wave radio, so you there was a way if you called the phone company in the big city, they could hook you in. We could do like a two way radio call, and because um, it was it was really super remote. Like the, it was it was kind of interesting too because this little island in the middle of nowhere had had a, a grassy runway as well strange i just think of it, it that all comes way back. it all comes back right <laughs> very interesting huh hmm, there might be some icons there but anyways um so yeah she wanted to leave she left and then um we were married and i was like okay and i was trying to stay teach and i did for a bit and then but she's like i want you to come home you gotta come home i was like yeah i'm a man you know i gotta go be with my wife or this isn't right because it was gonna so i did I, I i left too and i guess like about a month later they evacuated everybody out of the country because all the peace corps because um like civil war type thing gotcha <laughs> so i I've, i feel bad that i left early in this in that sense but i felt that i did the right thing because i had a wife and then, of course, we get divorced <laughs> a little bit thereafter. So I was like, Ugh. so anyways, that that was a little tough. But um, the uh, the Peace Corps was great because it it really it was uber challenging. And I would recommend it to people who are, who have something to give like that. And, you know, if you um, you do it though, I would say go single because gotcha. the divorce rate is so high. Uh, yeah, okay. for couples. I mean, I you know because it not, might be for certain people. Like certain people can handle the Solomon Islands and just sort of like you said, no water. But then certain people can, and that's just yeah, you know, it happens. So you're in the Solomon Islands. You're painting at the time. Oh, yeah. Are you painting in the Solomon Islands? Oh, yeah. How how accessible <laughs> how is how accessible is paint? Like how accessible can you do it? I mean, um, is this accessible? Like, are you able to get the paint that you need, the paint that you want, the canvases, the the material that you need, are you able to get it? Yeah, I br I no, I couldn't get anything there because it was. So, so what did you paint with? I brought it with me. Okay. Like so, you know, you can only bring so much on your two year adventure. And I my was your whole bag full of <laughs> yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, probably not. How do you preserve smart. it? Like, how do you keep like, you know. Are you are and again? Are you concentrating more on painting than sort of your job with the Peace Corps? I, I think that is probably another thing. I think that well, there was so much free time. I mean, I would I would remember going like three or four days without seeing another human, mm -hmm. and that's like that's like um, prison almost. You know, solitary confinement. It was it was tough, and you know there were bats and there, there's no air conditioning, there's no fan. It's hot. It's are yeah. you living with your wife at the time, and then when she leaves, are you just living? Or is it just yeah. you two living together, and that's yeah. it? Yeah, okay. it was at the school, then, but nobody would live at the school other than us. Okay, but people would come and yeah, it was about the size of this kitchen. Okay, the place it was really tiny, but um, I mean it was lovely. It was great. It was, you know, World Bank built it, I guess, and mm -hmm. but yeah, it was really tough. Yeah. <sighs> so so your paint so you're painting, you're doing the Peace Corps. Uh, your ex-wife leaves you, you decide to come back mm -hmm. to now, do you come back to DC or do you yeah. come go back to California, like Silicon Valley, that type of thing? Yep. Came back here, <laughs> lived in the apartment about the size of the, cause, cause I had my place still that I had bought when I was at IBM and I was renting it out to somebody. So there was a renter in there mm -hmm. and, um, so yeah, just moved, moved into a little place in DuPont circle. There wasn't, wasn't a kitchen, just, had a, a room and a bathroom 
<laughs> it was so hardcore. But nice. actually, it wasn't. It was it was it was utopia compared yeah. to what I just left. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So then I just took like some you know computer job out in Virginia. I had to take like the subway to the bus. Like I was still like in Peace Corps mode for a long time. Like I was just like, oh, whatever, I can do that. You know, mm-hmm. just killer stuff. And then, um, yeah, and then that marriage went away. And uh, but yeah, I was painting the whole time. Um, now you did a second stint with the Peace Corps, correct? Oh, I did Geek Corps. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> and Geek Corps was better because Geek Corps was much more suited to me, where I actually got to do computer work in Bulgaria, um, teaching what was ISO nine thousand. So it's all about testing. It's all about repeatable processes. It's about you know you build something, can you do it again? Can you can you use good practices? You know, right up my alley. It was it was good to teach. I was you know teaching to these people i guess because it was i don't know how many years after the soviet union but there was still a lot of soviet union looking stuff around Mm -hmm. there when i was there but um it was great it was only it was only for a month gotcha was that how soon after the peace corps did you do the geek corps stuff um probably within a year okay because i i wanted still to do that kind of thing that challenge or something i guess overseas um did you paint while you were in Bulgaria yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're paint. You're, yeah. That was a dumb. Qu- that's a dumb no. question because you pretty much paint everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. But how? Yeah. Well, yeah. And that one, I, g- I found a gallery and got them to show my work. Okay. And it was e- you could you could get a equi- you could get material. You know, yeah. not a little. Probably you didn't have to lug it all from here like you did to the Solomon Islands. Yeah, it was okay. a really really nice setup. They they put me up in a really nice apartment. It was good. I liked yeah. it. Was, was fun. Did you always know that that was going to be a, a temporary thing, the Geek Corps thing? Like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, those are only month long. Gotcha. Um, I, and then Dan even got accepted after I think before we were married. But then we were kind of talking. We're like, oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, so, um, but we. Uh, oh, well, anyway. So yeah. So I did. Yeah, Bulgaria. Yep. Gotcha. So you're doing. So um, do you go back into the corporate world? Um, sort of after Geek Core and sort of after the the yep. the Peace Core stuff. Yeah, that's when I started working for startups. I I had worked at AOL before the Peace Core, and I almost went back to AOL, but then I realized that it was too far out, like because it's really far commute if you didn't have a car. Because I don't I didn't have a car at that time, still haven't. <laughs> um, and um, so that was that was tough. I mean, AOL was a good job. I I liked it, but I just it was I don't know. So it was it's AOL. Fun. Was AOL your last corporate job? C- corporate, yeah. Okay. On the stock market, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the the other ones. But you did some startups and stuff too? Yep. Okay. I think I did three startups after that. And then. Um, All computer related? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one was like, uh, don- it was before Venmo. It was before all the online payment systems, but it was a, a way for political parties to have donations sent online. That was one down here in downtown D.C., right across from where Dana worked before I even knew her, which is pretty interesting. Gotcha. Um, and then another one was like a um, health care type for doctors for processing, like keeping their processes automated. I don't know. I can't remember what, what yeah. that one was either. And then, um, and then my last one was uh, web development websites, testing for that and that was the last one. That was gotcha. the, I'm out of here. Yeah. yeah. So that's sort of where we'll kind of start to go. So when you're working for these sort of startups or stuff like that, does the desire to start to do art, f- like, I'm, ass- I'm assuming you're, you're, you're making your art, you're selling your art, you know, you're, you're sort of have that duality of, you know, you're, you're an artist selling your paintings, making, I assume, a fairly decent mm. Yeah, back then I, I don't think I was. Yeah, I guess I was making okay, but I, yeah. I was, well, I mean, like you were able, you were starting to see the fruits of your labor. Let's say, like yeah. you were starting to realize that okay, maybe I can do this art thing yeah. full time. Yeah, because I I had created my own website in '96, so I was probably the. I, I hope somebody can check this. I was probably the first person to sell their art online. Oh, okay. Ever. I mean, I mean, there's a, a book in here from 95 or 96 that highlights my web page. Oh, wow. Like one of those, like old, it's kind of like a textbooky looking thing. Mm-hmm. Um, entertainment and on the web or something like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I've been doing this a long time. And so what I, I knew what to do was to keep email, you know, everybody's email address. So like, it was just basic business stuff. And 
so I built up a good collector base. I already had one when I when I left the corporate world and worked for oh, full so time. You, okay. So yeah. was it hard? Was it hard to do both? Like you know, wh- let's say we'll go from sort of those three startups before you decided to go full time. Was it hard for you to do both? Like to be able like to sell your art, be an artist, that type of thing, and then have to go to work. You know. No. Okay. No, I did both. I, yeah, I was very like one of my funny stories from IBM was I remember go actually seeing Black Flag down at the nine thirty club here. And this is probably like God, I don't know. What was that probably ninety five or something? I don't know. I can't remember. I have to look. But um and I remember going into my boss's my boss's he, he called me into his office that morning and he goes, Hey, you gotta, I gotta talk to you about something. And my ears were ringing so bad still. And he was telling me that he was going to nominate me for his job because he was leaving <laughs> as a manager. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. And I was, yeah. Yeah. I, I was like, okay, maybe this might be different. Gotcha. <laughs> I think I was wearing a tie at the time. And yeah. <laughs> so so um, do you start to lose interest with those three startups um, progressively because you're get, you, you know, you have that sort of, successful art business like you're, you're yeah. becoming sort of or would you say like were you getting bigger um when you were with those three startups or was it pretty much just like consistent throughout you know coming back oh, from yeah i was getting coming back from like a bulgaria and stuff like that you know were you were you starting to you know were you starting to sh- was that shift happening yeah i was showing all over the place um yeah, I was getting a lot of good shows and while I was working and um yeah, I guess that's what yeah, is that at, the question? Well, did, at what point like you know, did you see the did you see the end of the corporate world coming like and were you yeah. okay. Yeah, so you know what, what, I mean? what happened was yeah, I don't yeah know when I was you're working about. for the three startups, you know, progressively working as you're working for them are you saying, okay, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to work. I want to, you know, this is the last place that I'm going to work. I'm going to quit tomorrow or something like that. You know? Yeah. It was the, I wasn't working. I mean, it was like, there was too much idle time. Like I Mm. wouldn't even want to take lunch. Like I don't, you know, like I, I want to work constantly. I think I'm just that obsessive compulsive or whatever. And I felt like I was just, I had all this time I was burning that I could be painting or start my own business, which is what I did. And, and I just realized that there was way too much idle time. And I was just like, this is, this is just, I'm not my full potential. I wasn't being my best that mm-hmm. I could be. So what is the tipping point or, or where, what happens when you finally say, okay, um, this is the last startup that I'm working for. This is the last time I'm going to work in a corporate setting. You know, what was that sort of, when did that happen or when did that f- switch flip um you know or how do you tell yourself that you're ready to do that um i think it was because i was completely independent the divorce was through i had a 600 square foot maybe 550 square foot place that was mine i owned it in adams morgan i had a wall that i could paint on i got to do whatever i want all day in there and i'm like if i get all day just to paint i'm gonna kick some major butt like i i knew i could just because I saw the competition, and that's all any of this says, is you just got to outdo the other people who are doing what you're doing and sell it for less and be better and be be a good value for the money. And that I knew that that would work, and I was like, all I got to do is just do it. Like mm-hmm. it, it really came down to that for me because I, I knew enough about what I – because my big thing is I see other people who were art doing art in D.C., man, they were charging so much money for stuff. And everybody was always telling me, raise your prices, raise your prices. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the businessman here. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's worked wonderfully. Like, I think if anyone listens to this and takes anything from what I'm saying is, if you want to be a painter, just do it better than everybody else and don't charge, don't charge very much money. Like, you're not Picasso. I'm not Picasso. I'm not Basquiat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um you don't want to be those people either because I think what happens is you stop painting for what got you into it in the first place, mm-hmm. at least for me. Like I, I, I get so upset when either I'm, I mean, I, all the galleries I ever worked with, they always say, raise your prices, you know, and, 
And I was just like, oh, it just made me not want to paint. Mm-hmm. So many times I was like, this isn't fun anymore. Like, yeah. It's just money. It's yeah. dumb. Were you, were you nervous to go into the office that day and say, I'm done? Or, or were you scared no, of what not at was all, going to happen? They laid me off. That, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that third, <laughs> so that, that final sort I was of thrilled. startup laid you off. Okay. Yeah. I think I had, I think I had, uh, quitter's remorse from the peace corps <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like i'm not gonna quit and i'm not gonna you know like it's kind of like the football thing too like i'm i'm gonna stay in football just to show i can do it mm-hmm. and that's the, the only time i said oh i i need to quit because of family i need to go be with my wife mm-hmm. and that's that bit me i was like ah mm-hmm. so that that's why i've never i can't do that ever again yeah <laughs> um so how does the first is there any change? I mean, do you, does what shifts or what changes when you no longer have to go into a corporate job? I mean, were you, you know, were you, you know, not sure of what the first six months were going to be like, you know, sort of, or were you pretty much prepared to just go forward from there? Yeah, I was prepared. Yeah. I, Cause I like, I said on my way walking home that day, I secured a show. <laughs> so I just started working towards that show and I haven't asked to be in a show up since then. So like in 25 years, I've, I've, they just are 24 years. They've just fell in my lap, all these opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just through hard work and just busting as hard as I could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember sort of, um, so your style, so you kept that same style throughout this whole time, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so you mentioned about sort of galleries and shows and stuff like that. Um, you know, it seems like you started your gallery shows or your sort of independent, your shows fairly early. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so you were already, you know, you were still in the corporate world when you started doing gallery shows and stuff like that. Uh Do you remember your first gallery show? Uh, I think, well, probably something here in DC I would do probably like a group show um she's probably at a bar huh uh, um, so let's say do you remember your first sort of professional your first professional show like the first where you know what what it, any sort of normal f- person mm-hmm. like myself or a friend of mine who doesn't really know a lot about art but knows about gallery shows do you remember that one where oh. the f- the first sort of like the matt you know sisu Oh, like a solo show? Like gallery show, oh. you know, like that type of thing. The one that I, you could say the, the, the one that I, I've made it, you know what I mean? Like oh, that type of thing. That, that's that got to be the Visionary Museum. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. And that was a gal. So that's at that's a, museum. a museum. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's, let's go with that. I mean, how does, how does that happen? Like, how do you, <laughs> do you, does someone like email you or call, like someone gets your cell phone number or something yeah. and calls you and says, Matt, we're from the Visionary Museum in Baltimore. We'd like your paintings, yeah. please. Like, how the does way, it work? The way it started was like a street festival. So I was doing all the street festivals, all the ways to get exposure I could early on, which I tell that would be the advice I give everyone is like, you got to get your stuff out there. Even if you're the best painter in the world, no one's going to know you. And the internet, get off the, like, don't trust Instagram and all that crap to get it for you. So, um, I was selling up at the Suibo Festival in Baltimore, and that's kind of like, you know, the coolest. Baltimore's awesome, and, you know, it's like John Waters might be there. You know, who knows? There's great bands. And um, the owner of the gift shop at the Vision Art Museum saw my work, and he bought a bunch of my littles, like you did, mm-hmm. or your friend did. And, um, and then it started there, and then I'd go the next year, maybe he'd buy another one. And then I guess eventually I just introduced myself to the director at the museum, Rebecca Hofberger, who is an angel, an amazing person, and um, and Ted Ted uh, also at the gift shop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so uh, the uh, yeah, she put me in a group show, which I was like, okay, floored. so it didn't start. Yeah, she put okay. me, but that wasn't when I. I mean, it was nice. It was like two paintings, and I still wasn't very confident and. It was nice, and I felt very honored. But then it was probably like seven or eight years later, she just called me out of the blue and asked me if I wanted a solo show. And I don't th- I don't think – I think it was the only – the first solo show they'd ever had at the Vision Art Museum. Okay. And 
she kind of explained it to me that, you know, she's been watching me. So yeah, you got to keep working, everybody. And um, saw that my prices, you know, like that I was doing it for the right reasons. She she understood my story, understood what a lot of the imagery that I use, um, the icons. And, you know, it's just consistent, being consistent. And I've always painted the same way. And I don't, I probably even charge less for some of my work now than I did when I started um, selling on the streets of Georgetown. So it it's it's all about being true and being real and then she gave me that show that was up for a year okay so that was just that wasn't a permanent thing that was just um sort of like a showcase or like a you were there for a certain amount of time yeah and now they okay. but now they have my work in the permanent that's what I was, collection yeah, that's what yeah. okay so so how does that so how does that feeling when she comes to you and says we'd like to display mm. your stuff for a year i mean what is what what does that like how do you mm. how do you process that so the interesting thing was about that because I was I'd already been painting what twenty years or so I guess maybe more than that I don't know how many years, but a long time and so a lot of the old stuff I used to paint came from a emotional place that was raw and was first time and took a lot mm -hmm. of energy and some of the things that they wanted for the show they were like oh can you do kind of this again or that again oh so, so they didn't take the stuff that you had already had they wanted. They wanted both. Do they want old and new stuff, yeah. or do they just want all new well, stuff? Well, they, it was mostly people loaning their work that they had in their private collections. So, okay. like, people had paintings, and they would loan them to the museum for a year. And then I had to create some new stuff to go with it. And what I found very – it was very, very difficult because, of course, this is – you make it or break it on your <laughs> mm -hmm. museum show – and uh, so I really, really pushed myself probably too hard. Did and they did they ask for specific things? Like, were they very specific or did they let you be the artist? And did they just say, well, we want new yeah. paintings? So, yeah, they, you know, they I had total freedom, but they never, ever said, oh, we want you to paint a specific thing. They were just like, you know, might have some space to fill over here. here you could do this or that. And I was like, yeah, of course, you know, kind of like saying, yeah, I can do that. But the time and. It took me so much energy. It took. It was exhausting, but I did it. And I've I have a lot of stories like that where I basically pushed myself so hard that I can't even believe I did. Like I've done plays, like slept on the floor of play, like in Hollywood. I've done a thing there where um, uh, it's just crazy stories. But you know that kind of thing where you just like you push yourself to the limit. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that. I've been doing that for so long, and that's why to skip head to dana she saved my life dana did because she basically because i was we i will get in this to the other interview but like she came over visited me one time up in my place and i was morgan she just cried she goes how do you live like this it was i mean just crap all over just pain and just i mean i would go to bed pain all over me all the time and mm -hmm. it's just it yeah. wasn't healthy like i i i've been so much healthier now that I'm with her, but, nice. um, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was so, far. so, so you do sort of a year long show at the Baltimore visionary museum. Mm -hmm. Um, are you working with them sort of, are, is it your, in, are like, er, explain how it works. Like they ask for 50 paintings and they're going to display all of them for a year or do they ask for a few? Um, do you get your yeah. own sort of like wing of the place? How does that work? Yeah. Like Rebecca, Rebecca came to my studio and I showed her what I had and, um, she would tell me, you know, she would pick stuff and then I would, I collected from collectors the, the images that they had. And then I would show the, the people that were willing to, to loan the work. And so they gave me a, a, a big room. So it was a, it's, you know, it's oh, so it wasn't just your stuff that yeah. you showed. No, no, it was oh, all my stuff. Oh, okay. You but, would ask people that had owned, yeah. you, you asked people to. Yeah. So people who okay. own my work, they would loan it to the museum. Got it. Okay. And then the museum would like frame it up really nice. So people got really good frames, frames. and nice. yeah, and everything is a good you just deal. Don't have the painting for a year. Yeah. But it would have their name on it, you know, like from the mm -hmm. collection of and stuff. So that was pretty cool. You know, big openings, all that good stuff. It, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it was, it was transformative to me. And then, funny thing after, well, well, so anyway, so the current relationship is that they have the stuff in the permanent collection, but I also work with the gift shop and give, like, they'll come down and buy 
a hundred or two hundred paintings at a time. Oh, okay. And then resell them in the gift shop. So what I do is I sell them for really cheap to the gift shop, and then that way they can keep my prices the same as what anyone would get from me on the oh, website. Oh, so they get they get originals at. The oh yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I always thought it was just like prints and no, stuff. No, I've sold. Okay. They've probably sold like I don't know four or five thousand of my wow, paintings. Wow, that's awesome. Easily. <laughs> yeah. So so you have the year long stint. Um, mm -hmm. At what point? Um, is it soon after that that you start that they ask to do in a permanent collection or yeah. is it some time after? It was pretty much right away because I actually, to, truth be told, I offered. I said, if you guys want to keep any of these, you can have all of them. So, Anything you wanted that I had created for the show. Okay. And I think they took all of them, but a couple. Was that a you know, because you asked them, did it feel different? Like, how different was that when they when they said, did you offer thinking that they weren't going to take them? Or did you kind of have an idea that they were going to to, um, to, to do them permanently? I, I really didn't. I really didn't think about it. I was just like, I was so honored. And I was like, you know, you can just have them. I didn't I didn't even I should probably should have read it, written it off on taxes or something. To buy, <laughs> but I, like I always got it down. I go, God, that's, you know, we just, well, whatever. It, yeah. it, it's, it's so much more valuable I, for me to give them away and be in that museum than not being up there. Because that museum, one of our first dates, we were, Dan and I, we were up in Baltimore. We went to the Visionary Art Museum right when mm -hmm. they opened. And I told her, I go, one day I'm going to have a show here. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And that. And then they did. Yeah. It's just that whole you get focus and mantra and all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah I, I, I've been there before. So there's a possibility where I might have seen one of your paintings there, which mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Um, so what's it like? What What's the feel? Or we'll do two things. What's the feeling of having a permanent collection that you'll know for as long as that museum is there, mm -hmm. your paintings, people will see it. So a hundred years from now, people will see your paintings. Yeah. Um, how does that feel? Like, it, are you, is it exciting or is it just, are you a pre, I mean, of course you're, I would assume that you're appreciative of it, but, yeah. but what, how does that feel to know that for as long as that museum is there, your paintings will be viewed by, you know, countless generations? Yeah, it's, it's really cool. But to me, the most important thing is that my paintings are in people's homes mm -hmm. Cause I think they out, that will outlive the museum probably. Yes. And, um, you know, not having children like that is probably like people who have like that satisfaction you get from having a child. Although I, I wouldn't know, but you know, you're going to, you're carrying on your, mm -hmm. your genes and everything and, and that act of creation. And, and I recently heard a interview and I, they were talking about UFOs, but, um, the whole idea of creating and leaving something behind how that, transcends time like you're just you're you're almost eternal all of a mm -hmm. sudden so i think the creation of paintings for me is substitution for having children mm -hmm. in that sense and and if it gives anyone any joy that's incredibly positive for me or if they hate my work that's fine too I, just that they have a reaction or you know it, it's it's very satisfying um because when i paint it's the moment I'm just in the moment. I'm run, I'm not even. I don't care about my paintings after they're done. I, they just go in the drying rack, and I hope to sell them. And if somebody came up to me and said they liked a painting of mine that I've had forever, I'd probably give it to them because otherwise I'm going to paint over it, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. Because I'm going to paint something else. But luckily, I have enough materials to paint on that I I don't paint over stuff as much as I used to. But um, yeah, it's just that idea that. There will be stuff out there. Yeah, longer than I'm here. How many how many paintings are at the Baltimore Visionary Museum of yours? Uh, I think it's twenty. Uh, I don't yeah. know. I'd have to look online. I, yeah. Okay. Could you ask for them back if you wanted them? No, I never would. I don't know. But like, do you? I don't want them back. I um, mean, if they if they wanted to sell them to make money, they could do that. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't that wouldn't bother me. What about switching out? Like, do you say, hey, I you know this has been here for that long. Can I maybe put a new one in? Do they allow you to kind of oh. like switch out if you wanted to? I've no or idea. Or have you ever thought about that? If, no, I never thought about that. Okay. But if they wanted to, I'd let them. I mean, I they could do because to me, once somebody has a piece of mine, I don't. It's not. They can do whatever they oh, want. Oh, so they actually own them. Yeah. Okay. I thought yeah. maybe it was something where, you know, I, I don't, again, I'm very yeah. sort of ignorant when it comes to the art world and stuff, how museums work. I thought maybe it was, you know, I would just be so enamored with the fact that you would want that, yeah. that you'd be like, you know, oh, you, no, here, take them. And then, but yeah. then 
do you have the ability to say, well, I want to switch it out oh, or yeah, that? No. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. They, they can, they can paint over them if they want. Yeah. Like, <laughs> to me, it's the, the throw them in the, throw them like, in the harbor if sure. they want it to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally fine. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I, that's like when people resell my stuff on eBay or whatever. I'm like, good. Wow. I hope you do. I hope you, I hope you make whatever money you want off of it. I just yeah. glad that you bought it from me in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. I, that just, I won't even, I don't even want to go into why you would even sell. I mean, I can understand <laughs> if you were desperate, like if you were, you know, like I got to pay for a kidney yeah. transplant. Well, there's you know. a guy now who I love him to death. Is he buys a bunch of bunch of our work and he he sells them. He wow. turns and he because he he gets good deals from us. And yeah, he pays what everybody else pays. But then are you not? He'll upset? add like a zero at the end. No, not at all. No, no. Nope. I want him to do whatever you want with I mean, them because I'm done with it. And you're getting your art out there. It's become you're becoming more popular yeah. now. Now people might be mad that you're. Stuff so expensive that they're instead yeah. of it buying directly they, from you. But when I'm dead, I mean, give <laughs> Dana, you know, she can charge whatever she wants. She's gonna be like I'm Jackson Pollock and she's Lee Krasner. She taught she's taught me so much about art history, but yeah. apparently Lee Krasner jacked up all of Jackson Pollock's work once he died. Oh yeah, I mean, probably like uh, anyone would be surprised if any artist once they die their stuff gets jacked up. Yeah, it's with anything <laughs> like that, like sports. A memorabilia yeah. and stuff. It's like everything gets more expensive once you're dead. And it's like, it's kind of bad. Like, if anything, it should yeah. be more expensive when you're alive because you have someone there that can explain it or just that you have that person there that you can talk to them or whatever. Yeah. But, but yeah, because like, even if we had like, you know, millions and millions of dollars, we would still be here because in this apartment painting like this because. First off, we don't want to move out of D.C., and if you wanted to get a bigger place in D.C., it would be so expensive. <laughs> exactly. It would be impossible. And yep. I'd be like, why spend my money on just And it works here. Exp- you guys have a system. It works yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we talked about the museum show, and then speaking to Dana, you know, you talk about the gallery show. So, like, mm-hmm. the, the you mentioned it, the white wall show, I would say what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so explain to me sort of how, you know, do you remember the first sort of – you know, the I've made it or the the big sort of that type of show, you know, do you remember oh, sort like a of, gallery show? Yeah, like because 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 Dana sort of spoke mm-hmm. about it, that it's like, I guess a gallery wants to show your and sell your painting. So mm-hmm. whether it be, like I said, a, a shop down the street or the white wall, the one that we all think about, if you think about gallery shows, mm-hmm. you know, from movies and stuff like that. So do you remember sort of that, you know, uh, the the sort of stereotypical white wall gallery show do you remember your first one yeah i guess when i had the agent early okay. on she got got me a show on wall street with a group show mm-hmm. i think that was really cool yeah how <laughs> does it in work? new york city is okay. neat and and do i they... had a well, i'm sorry, oh, go sorry no go ahead go ahead sorry, I, sorry. I just I, I vaguely remember it but oh and i had a big one at hofstra university that was a really transformative one because it was a group show as well, but um, th- I met a person there that was doing a documentary. And I oh was yeah, in- there is a they did a documentary on you. Yeah, and okay. that's kind of how it started. Oh, nice. And that was cool. Yeah, I mean, they're all like for me, pretty much showing in New York is like, oh yeah, you made it. Um, but yeah, now which is the one that which is the one that stands out to you as sort of the one that you remember for it being sort of the best one or sort of the <laughs> or sort of the one that says well i you know i've always thought about gallery shows is you know because again like the stereotypical gallery show did you have one of those where it was like that white wall sort of hoity-toity you know oh, wine yeah. and cheese people oh, bidding yeah. like a ton so what was that like because you're not because no offense yeah. you don't seem like the type of person that no. would fit in with that sort of no and I, I i don't i don't do it i haven't done it and they, but God, I would always show up drunk or something. It's just mm-hmm. stupid. But, but I just couldn't e- deal with it. I couldn't deal with that attention. Like yeah. it, it was very, very, very hard for me. And I, yeah, I mean, I'm, they're, I mean, the, they're nice. And the, 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 these galleries, bless their heart, like they, I think they want to make a lot of money off of me. And they always try to get me to jack of the prices. And, you know, and I'll just be like, uh, you know, I'm not going to raise my price. And I sell everything. And, and it's over. And then they rarely did galleries work with me more than more than once. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a f- there's a few who were consistent. I don't do gallery shows anymore, but just because I can do it myself. Mm-hmm. But um, it just I don't know. Like it's it, like they they don't 
necessarily even want to know my story. Like a gotcha. lot of, a lot of, like they just kind of want the money. Yeah. And that's why I do, I'll just do the museums or universities now. You okay. know, if I, if I do another show, who knows, maybe I will never do another show again. Um, but I have ideas for shows if a university would like to talk to me because I have pretty much collectors in every state and we could show a pretty awesome set of work oh, no matter nice. where I go. So I kind of would like to do something in California. Gotcha. But I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, if they, if they don't have a financial interest in it, sometimes it's harder mm-hmm. to convince them to show me because I could, you know, I could promise, I mean, I don't want to promise a gallery, but I, I could guarantee they're going to sell hundred of my paintings if, you know, but, gotcha. but they, but they might make, the same as if they sold one painting from one of these uh yeah so what do you like picassos what do you like best about ga- or what is your favorite type of gallery show when when you were doing gallery shows what was your favorite type um well when i would have a solo i guess yeah let's go and when it would get a lot of press like if it was written in a paper or any kind of tv or anything um we had, we had some good ones like here in DC where we'd like have a band playing. Actually, my favorite gallery show was with Dana when we got married. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We got married at a at an opening. That was pretty cool. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, is it e- like when when you the the gallery shows that you like? Is it everything? What makes the gallery show? fun what makes the gallery show like because again you know that's gonna I, be really mean well, but, no, no 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 i mean because what i would say is the, my favorite part of a gallery show is when i get my work back oh really because i would if, think if, if 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 everything then sucks i'm like i can sell that what are you guys mm-hmm. doing yeah yeah because yeah. it so so it seems to me like gallery sh- gallery shows are all pretty much typically what we think of gallery shows are or are there different like because again i would yeah, if all, i were to do a gallery show you know for again you have to have a financial, I guess it's like sort of that financial interest that you have to have in order to do one. But is it, are all gallery shows those type of hoity toity, like mm. type of ones, or are there mm. good gallery yeah, shows? Yeah, actually, I can remember, I guess probably one where I really knew I, I made it was when I had like my first solo in Europe. Like, mm-hmm. so in Barcelona, uh, there was a gallery that I showed a bunch of times with. Um, those, the European shows have been awesome. Those were always just incredible experiences, challenging experiences. Because yeah. I would show up, whatever city, and I would paint the whole show like the oh, week before. Okay. Oh, nice. So you would bring, you would bring. I'd maybe stuff? bring a couple things, but yeah, I would probably create eighty to ninety percent of the show sitting like in a, a room the size of smaller in this kitchen. I did one like that, my first one in Barcelona. I didn't see any of the city. I just sat in there all day and painted. Nice. It's crazy. Um, yeah. What makes a good gallery show? The people, the 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 curator, the space, um, probably the location, like what city it's in. Because mm-hmm. I've definitely committed to do shows in places that didn't turn out the way I thought they would. Like I would have painted better just staying home mm-hmm. and then go just for the opening. Because um, usually what I do is I like to go to the place, live there for a month or a week before, a couple weeks, and paint there and paint what I see and feel. Um, those usually are quite fun, but I think the best, the best part <laughs> is when you, um, when I got to, when I got to go to places I never would have gone otherwise, mm-hmm. but I was only going to those cities because I was having a show, like a lot of the European stuff, Australia, although that wasn't the best show, but, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, was, did any, and again, we'll kind of we'll kind of end on your sort of gallery show. Um, would you do, or what was your sort of, which is, which was one of your favorites or, or, um, if you had to do, let's say you had to do one more, Mm -hmm. um, how would you, again, because you're, you're, you're basically choosing the paintings and stuff, right? Correct. Or does Mm -hmm. the, so, you know, if you could do the, the, the Matt Sisu, uh, gallery show of all gallery shows what would it be like what would you do if you could if if they if basically i got a building i or a, a oh, gallery yeah. i said matt do what you want oh i could um, curate the heck of, yeah yeah what would you do would you do just you would you do other people would you no, just me and i would have my film videos in it i would have the full story with with um descriptions and um yeah i would 
probably create all new work for it. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Actually, I'd want everybody to loan their stuff out so that we could somehow get them exposure, you know, if they mm -hmm. wanted to ever sell my work or whatever. Um, and I would just do a couple of things, but I would like to show things that I've done already, maybe more mm -hmm. than new stuff. I, of course, I would do, you know, a couple hundred new paintings, of course. smalls, yep. or something that people could buy and take home with them mm -hmm. so they could be new collectors. Yeah, that's probably what I would do. But nice. yeah, and I would want it to be a huge space with yeah. with uh, storefront windows. Nice. Would it be in DC? Mm, I don't know. Oh, Pro interesting. Yeah, probably. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, or Manhattan, but really, I don't know if I I understand New York very well. But I, yeah, probably, I don't know. I, maybe the, I, wherever you're gonna get the most people. Gotcha. So nice. maybe I don't know, China. <laughs> yep. <laughs> China, I don't know. There you go. Um, so we'll talk. A, I wanna. So your your painting is very sort of iconic and one of the thing it, it what it attracted one of it was one of the things that attracted me to your art is that it's like you said it has that sort of unconventional um to kind of use the frame ignorant art sort mm -hmm. of gal you know um so what to you you know what to what do you like about your art mm -hmm. and what do you you know and what do you try to put in your art that is an expression of you and sort of, you know, your artistry. Yeah. I think the, the thing that I run into is because I do this for a living now is that I do run into the playing the hits. Like I have about, I don't know, probably 30 iconic things, whether it's the rabbit, the dogs, the, I don't know, cat, owl, stuff you know, like there's things that I can just paint and I know they'll sell the fish. Um, so what happens is I get, into a point like if i don't sell a painting in a day <laughs> dana thinks i'm crazy but if i if i go a day without selling a painting i'm like i suck I'm, this is it i'm done <laughs> never again so i'll paint a fish or i'll paint a, a dog you know just because i think because i get that satisfaction i don't care if somebody's giving me five bucks or five thousand i just, it just i feel good that i did something that somebody wants um but the best paintings i do they come about probably like probably about 10 times a month maybe more where I'll, I'll have a day and I just get in the zone and I'll just, I know I'm doing something new and unique and it's got my energy in it. And I'm like, Oh, this is going to sell. This is going to sell. Like, I just, I know I'm there. And I, like the colors are right. Or, and that's what a lot of the things that I do now repeats of were things that originally I did because I was in the zone. Like my fish, I first did that in Barcelona, the, the bowl. I did that in Barcelona because it was the idea that I need to be strong and the fish, I want to do something bloody and weird. So I saw like a, fish when I was walking to the gallery or whatever um so I guess I has your answer. well has your has your style changed like or have like you said you've kept those iconic um characters and sort of things that you use in your paintings have they changed um you know as you've gotten older and went from you know doing it as you were doing the corporate work mm -hmm. to now like to now doing it full time like have you gotten better at it? Um, have you, you know, are you, you know, have you decided, you know, do those, do those symbols that you have have a greater meaning than they did previously? Like, yeah, the, I think the symbols are all the same. There's, I use the same things over and over so many times. Um, but I think the way my paintings have changed and will continue to change is just what materials I have available. Like I'm a big fan of Timu now, which is that Amazon in China thing. <laughs> okay. And um, you can get some really inexpensive uh, art materials on there, and it, it lets me take some chances with some things. And there's a few things that I've found that work really, really well for me right now that have made my work cleaner and maybe more risky. I, I'll I'll take more risks because I'm like, oh, whatever, that's like a dollar, you know, I'll just throw that on there and see what happens. But yeah, I mean it the idea of capitalism and you know competition with art supplies is great because you know I'll, I'll go to a paint store and say hey do you have any of the oops paint or the you know the the reject paint and i'll, I'll buy that like and that's a gallon of some color i'm going to use for the next five or six years nice. you know so you'll see that green over and over and over that mm -hmm. red or pink or whatever so so people buy your paint so people are buying your paintings um have you ever had has anyone that you couldn't believe 
actually knew about you, people, maybe someone that you admired, um, you know, yeah. growing up, like, has anybody bought your painting that you were starstruck about? Yeah. And you don't have to drop names, but. Oh, Ian Mackay. No really? way. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I did a, I, he's, I think he's cool, but it's really funny because I have pictures with him now that he's been at shows I've been at and. You know, I like to wear a little hat like him and everything. <laughs> no, he's cool. I like like what he's done. He's, yeah. he's kind of the DIY king, and his all like, there's so many lyrics and stuff that I've picked up on that are like, I can't say it on this because it uses a cuss word, but, but it is like that whole, like, at least I'm trying, what the F have you done? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it, it's all about being confident, and I don't know, it's good stuff. Great mm -hmm. memories, seeing Fugazi, and I didn't see Minor Threat because I was too young but um so oh, oh yeah that so him and then like i don't know what's that Zen, zenu princess warrior Zena princess uh, warrior. Okay, she's, yeah, bought, yeah, yeah. she's okay. bought one of my paintings kind of like she bought an obama i did oh okay um i think god what's that actor's name he's really famous what's his but his dad bought him one of mine okay i gave it to him for christmas so are I you never got a picture of it are you does it is it oh like rob Lowe, i think oh, okay yeah. gotcha <laughs> but whatever like yeah, that's what i mean so yeah. so do you like um is it are you does it make you feel any i'm assuming it doesn't make you feel any different that some famous person buys you no right? no, no yeah. the only thing i'm thinking is oh can i get a picture of you holding it but <laughs> yeah to, could, yeah just to, to, to put it on for advertising, yeah, for yeah, advertising marketing yep. but um no that the most the best paintings i've ever sold are ones i've given away like i remember giving somebody loving my is actually at sweet one of the sweet buff festivals i did up in baltimore somebody was really liking this big painting i did he's like oh it's really great or maybe it was a kid mm -hmm. and he goes god this is so cool I, I wish i had you know and i was probably charging 50 bucks for it and he didn't have it and i was like just take it nice yeah, That's i like that awesome. kind of thing i love like the yeah you know it's probably because you gone out oh longer. no you know he has it <laughs> hung up and like that's uh, yeah but but it is it's really just that that it's so satisfying like i was talking earlier about adam smith where you have connection to the with the end product and the customer it's mm -hmm. just like oh i love that nice have you ever refused to sell a painting to someone where you felt that not that they weren't deserving of it but you kind of were like you, you weren't sure that it would be as, as or you mm -hmm. know as appreciated or you know that type of thing i won't sell paintings to people that copy my work directly and i know about it okay that's kind of what do you mean by like so they'll use it like trace over it and stuff like that or or what no, do you mean by th that they're trying to they cop my style some and i'm like uh, like they'll do exact copies but okay you can t you know they do it in their style which it looks like they're trying to make it look like my painting and i, I wouldn't mind if they just said oh yeah matt ciso is a mm -hmm. influence i'll be like cool all right we're good but yeah. if they don't say that like, I, I don't know. It's, it just rubs me the wrong way. But, yeah, if somebody is inspired by me and does styles like me, I love it. They like, there's elementary school in Arlington, Virginia, that Dan and I go talk at every now and then. And they, they have, like, Matt Ciso, Dan Ellen art projects where they do, like, the cat, the owl. Oh, nice. Yeah, the, t the teacher that's wonderful. So. That's really cool. Yeah. So we've gone to speak at their assemblies and stuff. It's really rewarding. Yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> So... When it comes to your style, have you ever, um, have you ever decided to kind of move away, or did you ever want to try to? Ch did you ever have a desire to change it a little bit, like, you know, doing the the? And I'll kind of compound that. You know, does it get doing it full time? Does it get meticulous? Like, does it like? Oh, I've got to paint today, or do you no. actually enjoy? I love it. Like, yeah. Do yeah. you ever get like where like, oh, I got a paint today? Yeah, only that would only be if I had a gallery show or like, and that's where the galleries get get you in trouble, in a sense because you feel like you're forced into painting. But also, it's good because it forces you to do it. Like, mm -hmm. like, I don't ever need, you know, convincing to, to paint. I, I paint pretty much every day or do something art related every mm -hmm. day. But yeah, I paint at least six days a week. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to balance painting, um, you know, the website, um, selling your art, you know, doing the, you know, doing prints, um, you know, spending time with Dana? Mm -hmm. Like, um, is it, does it ever get overwhelming where the painting actually takes uh, sort of a, a, a side, a back nope. burner? No, we're, we're crazy. This is all we do. Mm -hmm. It's all we do we don't 
we don't i mean i don't even have like a friend group or anything like that i mean I, dan is my whole life in the painting and it's all i do mm -hmm. every day nice <laughs> um so one of kind of you're wearing this shirt but oh, uh, yeah. yeah so <sighs> sort of another thing that happened um you're it's just like the upside down biplane i think is like a famous stamp but um, there's like a famous stamp, but you were actually on a stamp. Yeah, at the United Nations. And that was a good story because... Yeah, how does that like, work? Like a, this happened to me a couple of times where I get an email or message. And I'm like, oh, that's spam. That's, <laughs> yep. delete, delete. Everybody thinks that, yep. And and it was something from the United Nations when I used one of my paintings for a postage stamp. So it's the internal UN postal system, I guess, so they can send mail between... I guess the whole world, but they use the UN postal system. Okay. So it's not like, you know, because if you had to send it from America to Switzerland, that's, they're going to charge you, you know, 20 bucks to send a package. But UN probably has their own way where they can, they bypass. Oh, and okay. So, so it's like an internal, it's like the internal stamp that only people in the UN or the UN can use. That they use. Yeah. You couldn't use it for like a postal stamp. Or Got it. So like the, the, it's up there on the wall, but th this one was, I think, I want to say, I don't even know what language it is. It's terrible to me, but it's, but it's written in some language um, that I don't speak. Um, and uh, yeah. How does that, That's like, on, oh. so someone just emails you and says, we'd like to use one of your paintings as a stamp? Yeah, because they, they had. Um, like how did they find you? Like, how did they, how um, did it? Probably Facebook or something. I okay. don't know. Or just maybe searching. Because this one was for disabled artists. So like uh, Chuck Close was a, the other another artist in it and then some other international people that i didn't know but um so everybody had like some some form of disability or something and um that's probably how they found me <laughs> yeah obviously mm -hmm. they probably googled it disabled artist um which i haven't said that in a long time but um yeah so that the uh that's yeah and they just kept writing me and i go oh i guess maybe this is real <laughs> they might have even called me um, but that painting that I used for that, that was one that was for a gallery show. And I had one, I, I had a little space I needed to fill and I just did it almost as angry. I was like, ah, oh, this stupid painting. I'll whip out a bunny. So I called it dive bomb. So it's basically someone fleeing from a bomb. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So it's, yeah. Did they pick the one that they wanted mm -hmm. or did they, okay. So they, they didn't ask like, can you give us one? They, they specifically yeah. asked for us for that one. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Because yeah, that kind of goes with what the UN does, I guess. Does but, it? Um, is it still in circulation? Like, does the UN still use it? Do you no, know? No, it was only. I think they used it for a year or two. But I, I was able to go to the UN in New York. They had a ceremony for me that was really cool. So mm -hmm. I got to go to the UN and talk or whatever, mm -hmm. cry. <laughs> oh, so happy. And um, and then I had a show in France, which was one of my favorite shows of all time. Was yeah, in Crusade, okay. France. Uh, which is near Switzerland, the border, and was able to get into Geneva and go to the the UN as well in Geneva. That's where I got this hoodie oh, nice. and um, and bought the stamp there too. So I bought the stamp in New York and also in Geneva, which is kind of cool. It's kind of rock star. Nice. What was your what's your favorite What was your favorite gal like favorite gallery show or showing? Like what Prob what if you could if if you could record or which one do you remember was your favorite and why it was your favorite? Like best experience probably was that one in France. It was strange and interesting because I, I got to stay in a house, like an old French farmhouse or yeah, I guess it was a farmhouse for like probably three weeks before the show. And that was really interesting. That was cool. The family was amazing. They're so good. People that own the gallery, there's, wonderful people wonderful neighbors everything really enjoyed myself dana came at the end to go to the opening that was great went to switzerland that was great you yeah. know just really fun so, um to go to europe and do that kind of thing but it's a lot of work yeah <laughs> so when you're sitting on the at the table in your in that group home do you like can and then you're sitting in like switzerland are are you just are you bewildered or like what am I, what's the the famous like talking heads like what am i doing no, yeah. here like, how did i get here yeah how you know it, I don't, is it surreal no. to you or is it no. just no i i still hate most everything i do i i think i suck i'm like <laughs> i do i'm like i just i i don't even know what i'm gonna like will my will I ever sell another painting or will anyone ever want one it, it's very it's a weird thing i just i have to keep doing new stuff i mm -hmm. i 
I mean, it was, I, I just thought, I guess I always feel like everybody does this. Like, I'm, I'm not like, I don't feel like I'm even, I mean, I guess I'm successful, but I don't feel anything. I, I don't know. What I don't even feel successful, but yeah. I, I guess. But is it just, did know. you ever expect that you'd be sitting in Switzerland, like doing an art gallery show when you were doing paintings in that group house? Like, no, I, I think I did the paintings early on because I thought it was a way for me to be like a, like a, a musician but without having to know how to do music it was a way to get that attention like i saw the like i used to i went to so many shows i was like oh my god how do i get to do this this looks so cool and fun and yeah so mm -hmm. i think that's the only reason i do it it was just kind of that attention and maybe it's a you know arm <laughs> thing attention away from the arm i don't know like yeah you know, i thought of all that crap but mm -hmm. yeah that's it's weird yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we'll kind of go into a couple of the um I did it with Dana, and and I'll do it with you. So, um, number one, uh, are you very particular about the paint that you use? Yep. Okay. Is it? Do you use acrylic or oil? Both. Both. Yeah. And I I used to get in trouble big time because I would and I still do, but I would use oil paint on paper. Okay. The, my agent was great because she was always like, you, "No, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's better material." But I'm like, "But the, it won't look the same. It just doesn't feel right for mm -hmm. me to paint on some things." You know. So, anyways, yeah. Yes. Okay. So are you, do you do, you do both? Yeah. Okay. Um, what, like you said, and it's a particular, like you can't, like if another brand is on sale, you won't buy it. You have to buy the no, certain. No, I'll buy, because all that matters, the secret coming, <laughs> all that matters is really your last layer. Okay. Um, so you can build up a lot of, you know, thickness and stuff using cheaper stuff at the bottom mm -hmm. and then put the good stuff on the top. Um, but yeah, I, I just whatever's around gotcha are you very particular about the medium that you use so like do you gear yourself more toward canvas are you more towards like paper um like do you have a specific medium that you prefer to use or are you pretty much just whatever yeah, you have whatever. lying around yeah i painted on wood yesterday oh which nice I all the time but yeah yeah yep no books like dana mm, if i don't book i did one book i think that i can even think of it was this automatic show you'll have to we okay. tell you about that it actually got yeah banned they closed the show what? because we all did two controversial it was like in 2004 or five here in dc okay it was like at the city museum and so they asked all of a, a few of us artists to do paintings about dc so i did a dictionary a to z of dictionary but it was all like super negative stuff <laughs> <laughs> and dana did super negative stuff and then this other girl her painting was on the tonight show it was so okay. successful it was one of george bush i think naked with dick cheney uh, it was weird but it was actually jay leno okay was the tonight oh, i showed it on his show so that was pretty cool but yeah it got closed down the city paper wrote about it wow <laughs> <laughs> um so how do you know when to start like how do you start a painting like, how do you, do you have an idea of what you want to paint or is it just, you know, you've got the, the material there and you say, I feel like painting this today or how does it work? Like, how does your, how does the process work for you? Um, do you know what you're going to paint when you, when you say, usually, okay, it's painting time. Usually like if I go to a museum and see something I like, I might try to copy of that, do a version of it or a picture. I mean, I, I've been on Metro before and done paintings off of Metro signs, ads um yeah that's just anywhere like i have i have folders and folders of pictures that i can look to whether it's life magazine national geographic i mean there's just tons of things i do use a lot of reference material that way so i'll paint from that or i'll just do stuff off the top of my head and just start moving it around i've done a few abstracts which i don't think are that successful i mean i i've done quite a few but i don't really think i like those as much because there's they're not specific enough for me so you have an idea of what you want to paint when you're ready to paint. Mm, yeah. Yeah, but not always. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I just start doing it and just make it up. Yeah. What's harder, the first brush stroke or the first sort of stroke of the of the art or the last uh, brush stroke? What's the hard, hard. what's harder? <laughs> probably the last ones because yeah. i have to sign it yeah. <laughs> without but, screwing it up well do you like will you all like how do you know when it's done how do you know when your painting's done um when somebody buys it well no no okay <laughs> smart okay. No, sorry. somebody's i know <laughs> yeah. i know no but it's funny um <laughs> oh, okay, how do you, it, like how do you know when you're because because to me i would just 
again, but I'm not an artist, but like I said, like I was talking to Dana about it, you know, Jackson Pollock, like, how do you know when you're yeah. done? Like, how do you know when you're like, okay, yeah. I don't want to add this. I don't want to add that. Okay. Stop away. So, it's finished. Yeah. For me, it's, it is the, the moment that's all I'm doing when I paint, like I, I'm standing in front of my wall or rarely sitting anymore. I always stand and paint, but it's kind of like the music and the, if I'm drinking or whatever, and it's just, I, get, I get up to like a crescendo and then I'm like, you know, and I can see that it looks like one of my paintings. And I, you know, if it doesn't look like one of my paintings, I'm not done. But once it kind of has my, my feel, my look, then I'm like, okay, we're getting there, getting there. And then I'll probably, you know, yeah, I get it. It's it's almost a time thing too, which is weird. Like sometimes I'm like, well, I got to be done painting by eight. <laughs> um, but I'll just I can crush it like whenever I need to, and if that's a good word to use, mm-hmm. I can crush. But <laughs> I'm such a young kid. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I some uh, usually I think about painting at night in the middle of the night if I'm up, and I'll try to plan what to paint the next day. Gotcha. Guess, yeah. Um, have you ever stopped paint? Like, have you ever gotten to a point where you really didn't know where to go? So do you have, in, do you have incomplete paintings? Uh, like, have you ever, Yeah, I have ones that I'm too confident about when I finish them. And then I look at them and I'm like, Oh, that sucks. Mm-hmm. So I'll just put it aside. And then either Dana will finish it for me, which is called her defiled painting series, or I'll go back and hit it later. And then sometimes like that would be probably interesting if somebody just I could have that stack so somebody could just look through and grab on I'm like, yeah, sure, ten bucks. I don't know. But um there was a funny story once there was somebody it was I guess it was for a ga- before a gallery show I was having and the curator was over and I had some paintings on my wall in here. Or maybe she's just visiting and they weren't done. And she goes, oh, I want to buy that one right now, the way it is. I'm like, Okay. Nice. <laughs> and I wasn't done with it. I was like, Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Do you do you not like do you not like having unfinished paintings or do you know will you do you feel like if it's unfinished you have to go back and do it or is it something where it's like you don't have anything to give to it like you're like you tried it it didn't work out you you weren't satisfied mm. with it like how does that do you feel like you have to finish every single painting that you do or are you yeah. comfortable not finishing a painting I have to finish everything because it's almost like I won't throw away spoiled food like i'll eat it you know i'll take the chance so i pretty much i don't want to waste anything so i would definitely whether i would paint over something completely but i will eventually go back and use every scrap of paper and canvas that i have something on nice yeah (laughs) um so have you ever thought about changing your style have you ever said i'm sick of doing the icon stuff or i don't i i don't feel like doing it I want to switch, but have you been hesitant in that because, you know, people know your art for what it is and you almost kind of can't change because maybe it might not sell or anything? Or or do you believe in the thing of screw it? I'm going to paint whatever I want. If it's different, like you, you, you don't do icons anymore. You, you know, you start doing impressionism or like, Mm -hmm. you know, Monet style paintings or whatever. Oh, I'd be so bored. Well, that's what I mean. But, but have you ever thought, I mean, just, I'm going kind of the extreme, but have you ever thought about changing your style? Yeah. Cause I realize I'm going to get old eventually. Well, not when you get old, but I mean, just that maybe you get, like you said, you know, that you start, you keep doing the icons, you know, that Mm. type of thing. You know, you said, well, I want to do something different today or I want to do something different for six months. Have you thought yeah. about that, but then maybe not done it because of the fact that, you know, nope. what you do, kind of your style and your what your signature type of style is, you couldn't sort of go away from that with the fear of maybe not selling those paintings no. or something. Yeah, because I've, I've done like sculpture with cat litter before. Okay. Painted it. Yeah, kitty litter sculptures. I've done, yeah, I've painted over stuff I buy at TJ Maxx or cut it in half and paste it back to, like little sculpture things i haven't done it in a long time but that was something i i did nail did well but um yeah i i i will just paint because i enjoy it now i don't i'm not really thankfully we have a, a roof <laughs> <laughs> um because we didn't buy a big place <laughs> um so yeah i i our goal really is just to Dan and I both is just to be free to paint whatever we want. Yeah, you're not all, afraid to take risks. 
Mm, no, I don't think so. I mean, because I could, I could always go back to <laughs> doing bunnies and fish, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, this is sort of a – so um, people – I've seen articles and, and they sort of uh, – about you and, and sort of – and I, do, I don't view you this way, but um, do you sometimes – would you sometimes not be known because of what happened with your arm? Um, typically, when something like that happens and you have sort of a, a certain, you're a very famous artist, but they, you know, are you worried that you're a famous artist or are you worried that people focus too much on the fact that you don't have an arm and you're an artist? Does it frustrate you sometimes when people kind of, when they group, when they when they talk about you, they have to sort of shoehorn um, the fact that you, uh, you know, that you do not have, you know, your arm and stuff, or, you know, because I don't look at you like that. Yeah. Uh, you could have, like I said, to me, your art speaks for itself. Who, you know, I know you're, and you, like you said, you're the art is a result, right, of you losing your arm. Yeah. So, yeah. But do you get mad that people? Or do you get upset or do you wish that people wouldn't focus on you losing your arm as a reason for your art or why? No. Yeah, I, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, because just like anything in marketing, like, or fame or celebrity, you look at, I mean, I'm not considering myself any of those things, but, but there is this, you have to be a product. You have to have something. Otherwise, I mean, it's, and I guess I came to that realization too with my arm. I was like, well, what, it makes me different and why not? I mean, you know, like a pretty girl, she's going to get maybe opportunities that, you know, I don't know, like it's just, or, you know, just we wear the right clothes in the right place. I don't know. Like people kind of were so visual, like everybody is so freaking visual. And I realized that. And that's why I'm kind of like, well, rather than, sit and maybe have a pity party about my arm i'm gonna be like no let's use this thing and that's kind of a joke i tell dana sometimes i go that's the best thing that ever happened to me <laughs> was my arm it's weird i do that <laughs> like some of the most sort of morbid stuff or just something that you wouldn't expect like you know in my case it was something that happened but it was the best thing that ever happened to me yeah. and it like a lot of people would say you're crazy like how could that be it but yeah. it does it, it it really is like sometimes what out of tragedy comes mm -hmm. triumph you know yeah. what i mean so yeah and that and thankfully we can both say that but i certainly understand that there's a lot of people who don't say that oh, and of course. i, and I yeah, yeah, feel yeah. feel for them and i'm sorry for that but oh absolutely but it is like I, maybe because it happened to me at such a young age and my family was so supportive i was able to take that attitude because the funny thing is, is i was back visiting my mom in nebraska and um where she stays it's like an independent living place but my uh pediatrician doctor was there too and i hadn't seen him in you know, like what 50 years or so i don't know what it was probably 40 years and he go he was just like wow we just we always we just wondered well how you we were always so happy or something and i was like i don't know like he goes we probably should have had you talk to somebody because i never like went to any psychiatry or anything mm -hmm. yep found painting and um mm -hmm. the painting really 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 gave me a lot of understanding i think for who i am what happened to me it's healing you hear that all the time healing art but um it it made the the nightmares went away things like that like it, it's just a whole like confidence thing that i got because i always knew i could do something more than what i was doing and mm -hmm. i always wanted to be my best self like i i if i get into a situation where i'm like oh i feel really constrained or i can't really do what i want or do what i think i need to do then that bums me out but right now living here with dana the way we have everything set up it's like i have complete freedom complete um self-actualization almost you know like that whole like at peace and um i feel very fortunate yeah so how do you deal with praise like how do you deal with sort of you know people oh you know the you know he's such a great artist you're mm. so great like like i've fawned over you like when i met like the first one i, when I ended up nice. coming i don't believe you though no <laughs> so I, you don't believe it no okay. i don't i don't i think i don't i don't do it for any reason just that that's what i'm doing and thankfully i can make a living off of it but there's no there's no sense of accomplishment i mean there is if, when you look at shows and when I start looking at my webpage and stuff, but then I get I get tired. 
I go, Dad, God, I'm so tired. I've just done so much of this stuff for so many years, and it's exhausting to look back on. I couldn't do it again. There's no way. If mm. you, I couldn't do what I've done now. A second time. No. Yeah. No, I know I couldn't. It's too much. Way too much. How do you deal with criticism? I mean, if, I'm assuming that since you don't really do well oh. with praise, how does it work with criticism? I love it. I'll say I agree. I'm, really? Yeah, if somebody hates my work. Or they go, oh, <laughs> oh, you're copying. I'm like, yes, it's fine. I don't, whatever. Say whatever you want. It doesn't, it doesn't, you have to have a super thick skin. Yeah. Being an artiste or whatever. Mm-hmm. Painter. I'm a painter. Um, that, that you can't put yourself out there and not expect to get, you know, there'll be people listen to this podcast and go, that sucks. He sucks. Yeah. <laughs> like, it'll be great. I'm like, okay, good. Yep. That's fine. Um, yeah. How do you deal with being compared like to other artists? Like, do you, you know, you don't want to, people don't want to say like, you know, Matt, C- Matt Sisu, you know, is like Basquiat or is like Picasso, like, or do you don't mind that? No, like, I don't mind. Okay. I, I would, those would be great comparisons. I'd like that. Um, but yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, I, because the more I learn about art, and most of it's all from Dana, like historical figures, Mm -hmm. I know there are some that I admire, very few I admire. Most of them are just terrible people, like really, really bad, like had really bad, bad personal lives or whatever. Um, I don't want to be remembered like them. I want to, I want to be known as the, the painter, artist, whatever that, made it affordable for everyone to have art. I kind of almost want to break the system in a sense. Like I want to, I want to ruin the pricing for some, some, you know, college graduate (laughs) who's charging $10,000 for something or whatever that happens in the city. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's, everybody should enjoy art. Like the fact that you were able to get a painting of mine, three paintings, three paintings of mine. And you even like, and again, cause, and it was not to interrupt, I'm sorry, Uh but, but the, I was willing to pay, for one of your paintings, what you had on your website. And then when I came and I said, I wanted to buy it, you like made it so much cheaper. I was yeah. ready to pay what you were going to pay on your website. And you're like, Oh, here, just, just this much. Uh-huh. It like, I literally blew my mind. Uh-huh. It was like, yeah. yeah. And it was, and again, it, yeah, that was, that was the kind of the, yeah, it was neat. Yeah. And I don't want people to think that I'm like some kind of trust oh, fund no, or, no, or no. rich that I'm able to, because Dana and I, we, we don't come from generational wealth. We had to create all this on our own. Like mm-hmm. it, I, she she'll tell you more when we talk together about how she got this place, which is an amazing good deal. But other than that, I mean, we've saved our money. Like we obviously don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, this place we couldn't afford to buy another apartment in this building because what she got this place for. But I mean, we've just saved and saved and saved, and we're cheap. I'm cheap. I'm really cheap. <laughs> I will not, but um, not deny it. Yep. Um. As you get older, do you think that your style will change? Are you a, are you are you willing to accept that your style may change 30, 40 years from now or uh, you know sort of what do you think what 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 is the matte artist going to be painting in 30 years? The same thing or do you think your style will change? It depends where I live. Oh, okay. If I come if I'm in an old folks home, I'll paint on a desk or just, you know, little watercolors. Um, if somebody wants to give me a big studio house <laughs> and I could paint really big, I would paint really big. We almost, Dan, I almost moved to Connecticut because after my AVAM show in Baltimore, having the big solo, I was like, oh, we should move to one of those big Jackson Pollock places yep. and paint huge. Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> that could, that almost happened. Yeah. Um, so as an artist, do you appreciate other artists like who's your favorite artists hmm. they're probably musicians and like i really admired charles bukowski okay he's the one who kind of got me in this, in this trouble because he was a postman and a poet and at mm-hmm. night he would write and get drunk and be really naughty and just be silly and funny and you know politically incorrect and all that and i just love the fact that he just hated his job and he was just like I just have to do this job to make money. And, but he became a famous poet for what he wasn't a famous postman. He was a famous poet. Um, so that probably, because he's probably my biggest influence. Although I haven't listened, read any of his stuff recently. I probably should. It's been many years, mm-hmm. but yep. I probably Bukowski. 
um, who are who are some of the artists that people may not know about that you're excited about? Like people are excited about your art. Are you excited about other people's art? Or <laughs> I don't know anyone. No. <laughs> I really don't. I I mean I should. There's this this um, exhibit coming up here in DC called Artomatic, mm -hmm. which Dan and I aren't doing. We did it like I think like five or six times in the past. But um, that's kind of an all comer show downtown here in the city, and they don't curate, so it could be anybody could show. Oh, okay. There and. Um, it, we've, I've done it in the past and it just, it was a lot of work, but I just don't have time right now for it, but, um, th maybe I'll see something in there. Oh, I like. nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll kind of, I'll go with these last two questions. So, um, and I asked, uh, Dana, the same type, um, what is art to you? Like what is, mm. so what, what is art to you? Anything that gets an emotional reaction, anything, it's, um, comedy is great art. Um, movies. I mean, anything that that evokes an emotion. So, that to me is art. Um, and it can be negative. It can be positive. I don't know. I I mean, positive art feels good, but so does sometimes seeing something that really chaps my ass might get me motivated to do something else. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, I mean, the term artist has been used for hundreds of years. Do you consider yourself an artist? No. Not till I'm dead, I guess, or I'm at the end. Because if I say I'm an artist now, that means that, oh, I've done my best. Start. It, to me, that's what it kind of sounds like. Like, oh, I've done my great work. I'm an artist. I'm like, no. I, there, I, I, I can't say I'm an artist. No way. No? Nope. Well, in my <laughs> eyes, you're an <laughs> well, artist, Matt. Well, but, thank uh, you. But I just want to <laughs> say, um, hopefully we covered everything. I mean, I, yeah. I can't think of anything else yeah that I, I would I, love to have a political discussion on one of these but probably not this one <laughs> yeah yeah we could or we could do uh if i ever want to do a music podcast where we could talk about like dc hardcore and all yeah, that stuff we'll I'll definitely fun. i will be definitely giving you a ring but yeah. um but no thank you so much for doing this like i can't tell you how for both of you and and we're gonna do a we're gonna do another podcast with both of you on it yeah. um but i just want to say thank you so much for like opening up your home and and your sort of you know uh, talent and just sort of you to do this with me. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Like the fact that I'm able to talk to people that fast, that to me are super extraordinary because of just mm -hmm. what you do and stuff. Um, thank you so much for doing it, Matt. I the appreciate it. The pleasure is all mine. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank um, you. Yeah, it's been great. Um, so have an awesome, amazing rest of your day. Thank you very much. Take it easy. All right. All right see you. Bye. All right, Matt. So if people wanted to find your artwork, purchase your artwork, support your art, um, where would they go? You have a uh, website, you right? You can Google one armed DC artist. No, <laughs> just kidding. Yep. Um, CISO.com. So I put all my new stuff on throughout the week as I create it at new.sesow.com. Uh, that's one way to find my art. Gotcha. Um, Instagram. Instagram is CISO, and I think Facebook is CISO also. And I have a Matt CISO Facebook. Um, and then Patreon, I have our Patreon is patron.ciso.com. So P A T R O N.ciso.com. And yeah. There's um, so, what can they, so on the Patreon, um, they support, that's a way of supporting your art and stuff like that. And then they get things. Yep. Uh, for for supporting you yeah I have you can just if you want to be just awesome and give me a dollar a month there's that and then I do like a sale probably every other month is what it's coming out so I'll have like a sale just for patreon patrons where you might get like free shipping or 20 percent off or something cool like that and then I have one where um I have all these art postcards that I've got on Vistaprint over the years not an ad and um what I do is I'll draw, like I do a unique drawing on the back of the postcard and they get that in the mail. And that's another tier. I think that's like eight bucks. And then I have like, you, I can just pick out a small painting and send that to you for 40 bucks. And then I have one where I do drink and draw, which is fun. Go to a bar and sketch. Uh, that's 25 bucks, I think. A little piece of paper or watercolor paper. And then I have one, if you want to be a 
super duper awesome person for 75 bucks a month um i just send you kind of like a, a painting like something from like an eight by ten on up so you get like an original piece of art that i just send you gotcha and then on your website uh that's where people can purchase your art and uh yep. Um, and they, it, you can ship your paintings to them as, yep, as international. well. Yeah. I okay. ship anywhere in the world. I've shipped everywhere in the world almost. Um, yep. And, and our postal system's great here. We get, we get, we go to the white, we go by the one by the white house. So your painting will be walked by the white house, no matter who's president, um, <laughs> on, uh, as it goes out to you. So it comes gotcha. right from Washington, DC. And then if you also wanted, could we, could someone come and pick up their art and, and, their artwork from yep. you yep yeah we if people schedule a time usually we do it in the mornings uh they can come look at what i have available and uh yeah go crazy and i'll probably give you a, a killer deal perfect <laughs> all right thanks matt appreciate thanks, it all right. all right see ya thanks for checking out this episode of the extraordinary ordinary interview if you enjoyed the episode you can rate and review the episode on spotify and apple podcasts you can also get in touch with the podcast on Instagram at Yappy Chatterbox Podcast or email at Yappy Chatterbox Podcast at gmail.com. Have a wonderful, awesome, amazing rest of the day, and thanks for listening.